Tonight, Grand Prix Speedway comes to Britain for the crucial fourth round clash. And with just three rounds left, it's make or break for the men in contention here in Coventry. But can anyone stop Poland's dark destroyer, Thomas Golub? Having won two of the three Grand Prix, he's already laid his claim to the title and continues to carry an awe of invincibility. to a balmy evening at Brandon. We're at Coventry for the British Grand Prix. It's round four of the championship. We're bringing all of it live here on Sky Sports. A crucial round for many of the contenders tonight. And a warm welcome to you. We are high above the first corner, right where we need to be. A fantastic atmosphere. Over 7,500 we've heard in the crowd to see this one. Sam Malenko is going to enjoy it with me. We've also got Kelvin Tatum right down in the pits as well. Looking forward to this? Yeah, it's definitely a warm night and uh, so far so good. I mean, the racing starting off really hot. Well, a lot of talk at the moment in this crowd about who's going to win the World Championship. And it's close at the moment. But so far, it's been dominated by one man, Thomas Gollum. He has a 65-point lead, but it's only just nine ahead of Jimmy Nielsen of Sweden. Tony Rickardson, the current world champion, he's in third place with 41. Stefan Dano's up there. Jason Crump, a lot of people will be watching him. He's already won the British Grand Prix twice. He's in fifth place. Anton Kasper's up there. Joe Screen is Britain's top man at the moment. He's in seventh place. And Greg Hancock rides here all the time, wants to do well here. He's in eighth. A little further down, a lot of eyes on Mark Laram, another wildcard entry. He's already won one Grand Prix, though, and has been one of the top riders in the British Elite League this year. No question about it, a lot of action. We're already underway, and we've already had some great action. But let's take a look at what happened in the first two heats. Well, Greg Hancock bounced out of the gate as we expected but it is his home track we expect him to do well here he does we? this every week here he is uh he had gate two with the blue helmet color there and he made the start just like he would if it was a normal league race and he basically got control of the race from the word go and uh, it worked out for him and and he won the race um mark laram was on the outside here he really didn't have much room out there john jurgensen followed uh greg for second place until he had an engine failure and he in the turn three i think the second to the last lap which gave uh Mark Laram, the second position. Well, those are the first two heats underway. You also got a glimpse there that Scott Nichols is riding. We're all looking forward to him, the youngster from Britain. He was second in him the first heat. Well, we're just about to get underway for the third heat, so let's get down to our commentary team once again, Peter Collins and Tony Millard. I have to tell you, Peter and I in the hottest commentary box you've ever known, but the racing, as the lad said, hot early on with heat number one, won by Greg Hancock on his home track ahead of Scott Nichols, third place Michael Carlson, and fourth was Robert Daddles from Poland. Heat number two, a good performance by Mark Laram in second place behind Lee Adams, and uh, Tony Kasper and uh, Jon Jorgensen, who had an engine failure, will have to try again. But heat number three now will sort out the sheep from the goats. Remember, they slot into places all over the place, and Henrik Gustafsson goes in red on the inside for heat number three from Sweden. Chris Louis, Britain's hope in the blue in gate number two. That man in yellow and black there, Andy Smith, another Brit, three times British champion actually riding on this track. And uh, Billy Hamill, the remaining rider in the white helmet colours, also on his home track. But Peter Collins alongside me, Andy Smith expected to do well here at Coventry. Well, Andy's had some great meetings over the years here. He, he was uh, he won the British Championship back-to-back uh, -back three years on the run in the early 90s. He did ride for Coventry for a while. He is a specialist here, but, of course, Billy Hamill's also out there. And uh, there's Chris Louie in the blue. He's actually very, very good. He's won the British Championship uh, last year here, and uh, it's certainly a favourite for the English boys as well, being here on their own doorstep, Tony. Well, Billy Hamill there, we see, I can tell you, he has two machines in the pits, one with a GM motor, one with a Jawa, but he's on the GM. He says he's been riding Jawa in recent weeks, but decided to go back to the GM tonight. 
Yeah, he's uh, a bit lost at the moment with his equipment. Uh, he's been uh, he's come back riding for Coventry recently, and he's got bike problems at the moment because he doesn't know what to ride. There's the lineup. Henry Gustafsson on the inside, Chris Louis in blue. Billy Hamill goes in white from gate three on his home league track, and Andy Smith, three times the British champion here on this track, he goes from the outside. That's the lineup. This is heat number three. The action in front of nearly 10,000 fans in this Pax Brandon Stadium. But uh, this one is going to be tight. There's real problems here now. And the machine going back, that is Billy Hamill. And Billy Hamill is expected to get a second machine here. He's already got early problems. And certainly it's going to provide problems. Look, they're helping him here. They know the gates here. They know how to get him on the track quickly. And his pit staff includes Shane Parker, uh, an Australian international rider, of course, helping him. But this is Billy Hamill. And he's on his second machine already, PC. That'll cause him problems. Well, we did say that Billy was having problems with his machinery. And, of course, he goes round to the start there. And uh, either one bike stopped. He's certainly not happy with it. So he's um, actually he's heading back towards the pits again. So he's really got problems. Well, I don't know what we have. The referee will have him on two minutes now, Billy Hamill. And that's uh, real problems for the man who's a permanent wild card, of course, in the uh, Grand Prix series. And now he's got two bikes on the way back to, tip, uh, back to pits. So the riders lining up here now. It looks as if Billy Hamill could miss the start of this and will be. He is excluded, Billy Hamill. The referee has excluded Billy Hamill under the two-minute warning. The controversial Hungarian referee is Isvan Durago, and already Hamill missing this one. But away we go with three riders in heat number three. On the inside, Henrik Gustafsson. He's in red, but coming round a pace on the outside. Andy Smith picks it up. Good for the Brits here, for Andy down the back straight, back in third place, Chris Louie. Louie's having a go to go by Gustafsson as well. Great ride by Chris Louie, look, and it's Brits, one and two, PC. Yeah, it is, we said Andy likes Coventry, and he's certainly proving us right here, and Chris Louie's tucked in right behind him. Andy's not riding wide enough at the moment because Chris is really having a good go around that inside, but now Gustafsson there in the red's doing the big blast around the outside. Gustafsson spotted that grip is on the outside as well, but Andy Smith on the inside is holding his line fast. Gustafsson's gone too wide now. Chris Louie in second place. This is going to be Britain one and two. This is a tremendous effort here with a lap to go. Andy Smith uh, twice or three times a British champion here on the final lap ahead of Chris Louie. And this is great for Britain because already we've had a second place for Mark Laram, a second place for Scott Nichols, And now we've got the other two Brits packing first and second here. A great night. Andy Smith the win in yellow. In blue, Chris Louis in second place, Henrik Gustafsson in red in third place. That really was a tremendous ride for the two Brits, and none better than that man, Andy Smith. We've often talked about him as the Houdini. He's won that one. It's Britain one and two. Andy Smith and Chris Louis in third place, Henrik Gustafsson. Billy Hamill excluded, will have to ride again, but from the start it was important. Andy did well, Chris Louis did well. That's Chris Louis in the blue helmet. Gustafsson's on the inside, but straight into the picture from the outside comes Andy Smith. I think it helped Andy that uh, Billy Hamill wasn't next to him on the start line there. Gave him more room on the starting gate to make that first turn manoeuvre. And Andy certainly cashed in on that one. He made a great run round the outside on the first turn. The track's a little wet and slippery right now. It's so hot at the moment that they've put that much water down on the track. But the track seems to be pretty, pretty good at the moment. And uh, Andy's riding a great ride here. He's covering that lead and uh, he's great to stay there in that first place ahead of Chris Louie. Well, a marvellous performance by the Brits in that one. But Heat 2 was won by an Australian, Lee Adams. And he's in the pits with our reporter, Kelvin Tatum. OK, you're joining me down in the pits with Lee Adams. And it's uh, Lee, you had a superb ride in your first ride. Came out of gate two. Seemed to work really well. Yeah, I was really happy, you know. I, I, when I got here, gate one looked very nice. But uh, I managed to get over Tony Casper. And uh, I had a pretty good run out of the first corner. And uh, just went from there. But... It looks like the dirt's going to move out a little bit. Andy made a good one off four and uh, pretty much chased the dirt around. So I think by the end of the meeting, we're going to be running pretty high. Right. So but, uh, you must have been very happy to have popped out and start in the, in the Grand Prix and settled your nerves down. Yeah, it's always nice to get the first one out of the way and, uh, you know, to come out with a win, it's, it's good. You get gate one in your next ride and, and just go from there. And, uh, you know, the, the big aim is get through to the main meeting and, and take it as it comes. All right. But as you said, you know, the gate one in the next ride, do you think that's going to be slightly tricky with the dirt moving up? Well, not, not really. I think uh, gate one's fairly grippy, so if I can come out fairly clean, I can get into the dirt and, and pretty much run off the turn, I hope. OK. All right, OK, thanks very much, Lee. Um, uh, back over to uh, Peter and Tony, I believe.
Well, I can tell you, Kelvin's talking to Lee Adams and he'll be meeting Scott Nichols and Chris Louie as two British riders in heat number eight in his next outing. And they'll be going from the wide gates, Lee Adams on the inside. But now we move on to heat number four. Disappointed, of course, in that one for Billy Hamill. Heat number four there in the blue helmet colours. That's Peter Carlson, the second of the Carlson brothers. He, of course, rides in Britain for Wolverhampton. The old Swedish colours on the mud guard there. And there he is coming up to Tate. We just saw fading from picture in white, Brian Anderson, the commentary captain, who also rides regularly on this track in his league action. The man in the red helmet colours on the inside is the Dane of Brian Carger. Brian Anderson coming up to Tate. Peter Carlson already there in gate number two. And we are without, of course, a rider here. Just three riders taking part in this because Mario Yeru was out in practice having hurt his leg. He was hospitalised last night. Stitches... Uh, Ligaments at the back of his knee, a horrendous crash in practice for that, Peter, which ensures him, though, of 24th place tonight and money. Yeah, I think it's the, the primary chain that did all the damage. I think he broke a primary chain, and uh, it, that's what cut the uh, the calf muscle, and, uh, you know, he's certainly not able to ride today, Tony, that's for sure. Heat number four shows Brian Carger on the inside. Peter Carlson goes from gate two. Brian Anderson, the Dane from gate three. Two Danes and a Swede, just three riders. Remember, Yeru qualifies for last place. On the inside in red, there is Brian Carger. Going around and picking it up on the outside, Brian Anderson tracking him. On the inside in blue is Peter Carlson. It's close in second and third place, but the man in front there is Brian Carger. He's hugging the racing line, which seems to move wider and wider already. And that inside gate may have helped him from the start, but the racing line's not there, and Carger's picking up that line. Yeah, Carger's flying, really, and um, Peter Carlson's tucked in behind him. But uh, the surprise is Brian Anderson, the home rider here at Coventry. He's struggling there in third place, and he doesn't look as though he's going to catch these two. Well, disappointment there because he started so well, but the rider in front, Grant Carger, is getting his wheels in line. He's picking the part of the track he wants, and he's riding almost wheel perfect there with a lap and a quarter to go. Ahead of the man in second place, Peter Carlson. These two will march on. Brian Anderson will have to battle again. Remember, if you have a second or third and fourth place, two heats in a row, then you're eliminated. But here now is this end of heat number four. This is going to be one come to me by Brian Carger in red. Second place in blue is Peter Carlson. Third in white there is Brian Anderson. Disappointment for the home track rider. But triumph for this man, Brian Carger from Denmark. And Brian Carger knew exactly what he wanted to do there. And uh, the young man from Horsands in Denmark, I say young, he's 32 years old, one of the older riders in the field, has won that ahead of Peter Carlson and Brian Anderson. Remember, Mario Yeru missing from there. But it, from the gate, it was important, and on the inside, it was picked up well by that, Brian Carger. Yeah, that's Brian Anderson on the outside, Tony. I really expected more from Brian. Uh, he's on the outside there. He's actually in the dirt going into the corner. Now, that's the fast line on the outside, but he doesn't seem to use that to the full advantage because on the inside, Brian Carger's made a very determined first turn. He's riding very, very well, riding mid-track. Uh, Peter Carlson's trying along the inside line, but there, Brian Carger's got a great run now down the outside. And uh, when riders make a start like this round Coventry, very difficult to overtake, but uh, it was a brilliant ride from Carger. A brilliant ride from Carger, no real surprises so far, but disappointment for Billy Hamill, of course, in Heat 3. Plenty more action coming from Brandon Stadium here at Coventry in the British Speedway Grand Prix. Only four heats have gone. There are 20 more to come. More after the break. Welcome back to Coventry. These the scenes from the pits at the moment. Live all night here for the Grand Prix action. And so far, the meeting has been fast and furious, but it's exactly what we expected. And Sam Omelenko, finally, we had to rush on there because obviously we were already under action. We've got a chance to talk to you now. Um, an exciting meeting for many, many reasons, not only the fact that everybody's chasing Thomas Gollum. Yeah, I mean, it's real important for the bottom half of the guys just to stay in this meeting and stay in the top eight because if you're out of the top eight, then you have to go to the challenge, and that's a tough battle. I've been there before, and that's why I'm still not in the Grand Prix. But, you know, a lot of the guys, um, they're... they're you know, every point counts out there right now. This is the, the first round of the second half of the Grand Prix. It's real important that the guys do well. Which rider does this particular track... I mean, obviously, we've got the likes of Hancock and Hamill who ride here every week, but who, I've heard that Golub is not necessarily a favorite for this particular... because he's not that good at this track. I mean, most of the Continental tracks are a much larger tracks, a lot more dirt, and there's a lot more space to really race for. And, I mean, Thomas proved it when he rode at Wrocław at the last GP to be able to pass Jimmy in the last corner. This track will probably give some of those guys those advantages only if guys make mistakes because it's such a tight track i mean this is going to probably favor the guys like jimmy nielsen jason crump greg hancock because it's his home track 
I mean, there's going to be a couple of guys like Brian Anderson who mm-hmm. had a bad race, but it's going to happen because the gates are going to the gates are going to have a lot to do with how they finish the race. Well, let's go back to Billy Hamill. I mentioned him earlier, but that's the big story already. I mean, we at the beginning of the evening, here he is trying to um, you know get into his heat, which was actually. Um, Heat well, three, he tried to he tried to get into heat three. I think had it, trouble with his bike. Yeah, I think at this stage, excluded. the way the new rules are, I mean, you have two minutes once you leave the pit gate, and uh, he was probably already past the two minutes and realized it when they made the effort to bring in the bike out to him, the shortest way to get to the first to the start line, and uh, he was signaled straight off the racetrack. So unfortunate for Billy because I mean his heart's in it. He's got to do well. This is his home track. You know, he feels disappointed probably for the fans and his, and his team and everybody. Well, unlike Billy at all, I've heard he's not even talking to us. He won't talk to Kelvin, which is, you know, most unheard of. Yeah. He's 21st in the championship. This is a disastrous year for him. I mean, it? he's just going to have to start all over. He's going to have to go to that challenge now and keep his head up and uh, hopefully make something out of that and get back in it next year. Yeah, well, we hope so. Well, they're lining up for Heat 5 now, so let's get down to our commentary once, once a team. Oh, our commentary team once again of Peter Collins and Tony Millard. This is heat number five. Just three riders in this, of course, because the absent Mario Yeru, assured of 24th place, and it leaves just three riders in this. Yeru would have been going in yellow on the outside. In the inside, it's Michael Carlson in red from Sweden. Henrik Gustafsson, fellow Swede, goes from gate two. John Jorgensen, who used to ride a lot here for Coventry, somewhat surprisingly had a problem. His first ride goes from gate three. Remember, the last man, it would normally be the last two, the last man is eliminated from this event. He will take just one Grand Prix point and uh, well the last man he will actually get two Grand Prix points because Yuru gets one Grand Prix point the others two will march on to the next stage away we go now we look on the inside there in red and picking it up is Michael Carlson going slightly wider and Jon Jorgensen is using his track expertise but now he's blocked out he's hit the fence at the back and it looks as if the Dane Jon Jorgensen will fade away from this to lead the two Swedes Gustafsson in the blue helmet colours Michael Carlson in red to follow their way round and move on to the next stage of this Grand Prix but disappointment for Jorgensen at the back no such problems out front for the two Swedes no uh, Henke Gustafsson's riding uh very very confidently here. he's very very hard on that first turn with John Jorgensen John sort of ran out of track and uh, Henker helped him on his way there gave him a bit of a shove but Henker's really riding well he's got to be determined because in the past he's not really put everything together in the Grand Prix but now he's coming under some pressure from fellow countryman Michael Carlson Henrik Gustafsson looking sure out front in this one, rather better than his golf was this morning, I can tell you, down the road. But out front, Henrik Gustafsson will win this in blue, ahead of Michael Carlsen. The two Swedes will march on, and the first man to go out tonight will be John Jorgensen, the Dane, who used to ride here for Coventry. Real disappointment for him, and John Jorgensen can go home with just two Grand Prix points to his name as the third rider in heat number five and that is desperately disappointing for the Dane but well glory for Henrik Gustafsson he marches on his chances increase again Gustafsson the winner ahead of Michael Carlson the two Swedes continue in this Grand Prix John Jorgensen goes out and from the start well it was vital Jorgensen taken wide and really didn't enjoy it that's right Jorgensen on the outside there in the white helmet you can see he makes a pretty good start but Henke Gustafsson is right with him as they go into that first turn now it looks as though Gustafsson's uh, uh, Jorgensen is leading this race, but Gustafsson's riding that inside run there. And you see now he takes the line away totally from John Jorgensen, takes Jorgensen's front wheel away. John goes off towards the fence, and uh, unfortunately for him, that position is the end of his ma- meeting because he's back to the changing rooms. And uh, Gustafsson and Michael Carlson made a great race there together for those two qualifying uh, positions. Well, from then on, as you say, it was the loser's heat. Heat six coming up now is also a loser's heat. It was tough there for John Jorgensen as he went into the fence. And from there on, really, he had nowhere to go and nothing to do. And real disappointment for the Dane. He can go home with two Grand Prix points to his name. And for John Jorgensen, really, that desperately disappointing. He was 12th in the standings with 25 Grand Prix points. That now gives him 27. But as we move on now to heat number six, this again, a loser's heat. We see in the blue helmet colours there, Brian Anderson at the front of your camera. On the inside in red is Tony Casper, that man in yellow in the background, Billy Hamill, who had such disappointment, number 22, and the rider with number 14 there on his uh, mic also joins in. In this one is uh, Brian Anderson. The rider in red there is Tony Casper, that man in blue, Brian Anderson. Anderson disappointing last time, a Coventry captain, more familiar with the track, of course. 
Why is it here? Uh, we've got a couple of Coventry riders in this heat, uh, Peter, and uh, so they'll be expected to do well, wouldn't they? Yeah, this track's very familiar to just about everybody here. I mean, they, most of the riders in this sort of match uh, actually ride in the Elite League, and Coventry's uh, well up there, and they're regularly on this track, so it's, it's basically a track that they all know, so anybody could win here. Tony Casper on the inside of Brian Anderson, Gate 2. Robert Dadas, the pole. Disappointing first time out goes from Gate 3. And Billy Hamill, who suffered that machine problem and missed the two minutes, was unable to keep. But it's desperate for Billy Hamill to get in the first two in this one if he's going to march on. We just see the opportunity. Tony Casper, of course, uh, on continental tracks, looks a different rider from what he does on British tracks. And he's on the inside, perhaps a shade tight for him. The starting marshal moves away. Up go the tapes, but Casper picks it up. A little bit of jousting there between the rider in white, Danos and Billy Hamill. Hamill's left at the back. Could this be another desperate disappointment for Billy Hamill, the former world champion? Because he's going to go out of this if he can. Oh, up on the top there. Two riders into the fence. The referee will have to stop this one. And this may be the saviour for Billy Hamill because he was nowhere in that one as the two riders in front of him piled into the fence. Billy Hamill is perfectly OK. Brian Anderson's OK. But that was Robert Dados and Tony Casper, the two Eastern European riders. And really, well, Peter, it was wild riding, wasn't it? Look at it. Yeah, Dados is having a big go round the outside, gets it all wrong, he catches Casper, but Casper goes down very, very badly, he falls very heavily into that fence there. That's the worst part of the track that you could possibly ever want to crash. And we can see this one again, Dados has already gone down, he's hit the fence there, quite lightly to be honest, but uh, Tony Casper's gone in very, very hard into that gate where they come out. The referee has excluded Robert Danos as the cause of that stoppage, and that really is a little bit odd, but let's see what Casper did in front. Danos went down first, Peter. Yes, but Danos actually caught uh, Tony Casper's back wheel and threw uh, Tony totally offline. Tony got in all knots uh, a bit later on as he went out of camera, and... Um, he crashed very heavily into that bit of fence there, and I do sort of feel for him. I just hope he's going to get up and walk away from this one. Well, Robert Dados will have to walk away from Coventry because Robert Dados is out of this meeting. Robert Dados, excluded by our Hungarian referee, Isvan Drago, as the prime cause of the stoppage. And repairs to the fence will take a minute or two before we can get the meeting underway again, I'm sure. We can see what's happened there. So down in our studio pit side is Jonathan Green and Samo Malenko. Yeah, it's a horrible sight to see that, Sam, and uh, it just does give us a, a couple of minutes to talk about it. You were watching it very closely. What, what were your thoughts when well, you saw that? I was very concerned. I mean, it was obviously the opposite side of where we're standing, and it looks like Dadis was on the outside, and the way this track sucks the riders in, I mean, they're... Um well, it's just one of those things. These guys aren't regular riders at this track. I know PC said that lot, most of these guys are, but Dadis and both Casper aren't. And this track is very narrow straightaways, and when you get in the corner, it opens up. And the way the track's been going, if they've been watching it, the guys that are winning are using the high line right now, and I think they both are chasing the high line. Well, let's take a look at it, Sam. We can see it here in the monitor, and uh, here's a nice close-up of uh, well, Dadis, Dadis is fighting it. Dadis definitely got a lot of grip going in there, tried to control it. It doesn't look like from that picture there that he actually touched him, but... The way this track is set up, that is actually the entry to the track, and we don't see it just past him right there. And that is where Casper came off and went straight into the fence. I mean, he didn't have a, uh, an arc to slide off of. He went straight into what it. What concerns me, I know you were in a big tumble yourself at Hull uh, a couple of weeks ago. What about Casper? Because that's the real worry, isn't it? I mean, it's definitely, um, if he hit his back or something, I mean, because he went straight, it looked like they're working on him down there. And if he's injured himself, he's probably shunt himself pretty hard. Um, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely a problem. I hope that he's okay. I mean, he's he's a pretty tough guy. He's one of the older chaps like me. So <laughs> well, let's take a look at it next to another angle if we can. Oh, perhaps. here you go. You can see Casper. There he goes. He just gets off the bike, and we don't see it, but you can see the bike bounce off that fence. So the fence did not move, and he was underneath it. So, I mean, geez, you know, he's probably, he's probably went straight into it pretty awkward. They did show a bit of a view of it where his legs were tangled a bit, so maybe he went in with his legs. Okay, well, they're just putting some repairs to the fence down there. It's just a couple of hundred yards from where we are. And just about 15 yards over there is Kelvin Tatum. He's in the pits and he's talking to one of the British hopefuls, Scott Nichols. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm, uh, joining me now is Scott. While there's a small delay with the crash, I'm going to have a quick word with him. Scott, this is your, your first Grand Prix, obviously, as a wild card. You must be delighted to be here. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, it's probably well, it's one of the biggest, well, the biggest men I've ever competed in. So, um, yeah, I'm delighted to have been chosen for it. And, um, you know, I got my first race set away. There's always big nerves to that one, so hopefully I can carry on. I had a you know, pretty good start, so it seems okay. Yeah, you finished second in the race, and you said to me just, just 
just before we, we, we were talking that it was a bit greasy in the first race. Do you feel that, you know, um, uh, you cope with the, with the conditions quite well? Yeah, I mean, the, the, like in the first one, it was sort of wet and a bit sort of greasy, so... And now I see the track has changed a lot and I've got quite a big gap between my race, so I'm just trying to have a look at the track and see how it's changing. Um, try and work out, hopefully I've done the right thing to my bike to compensate for the change. OK, I know that you've got an injured hand and there was some uh, talk about that you wouldn't take part this evening. Obviously, it's, uh, it's, it's working OK. Yeah, I injured my hand a week ago. Um, you know, I was obviously a little bit worried because I've got the under 21 final next week, which is, you know, very important to me. Um, so I wasn't going to do anything that I thought would jeopardise that, and I did practice yesterday, and the hand felt OK. So, you know, it's not perfect, but, you know, I'm getting on with it, and I didn't really have any problems in my first ride. So hopefully, you know, it won't be a problem, and I'll be able to go on and have some more good races. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, uh, best of luck for the rest of the meeting, and now back to the Coventry Box. Well, certainly lots of conversations. There's the phone in the pits where they have a chat with the referee, and I'm just wondering, that's Robert Dados we saw walking away from the phone who clearly was complaining about his exclusion. There may be some language difficulties. Robert Dados of Pole, our referee is the Hungarian, controversially in charge of the Intercontinental Final, which uh, took four hours to compete, Peter. How difficult is it to communicate with a referee from that part of the world? Well, it looks as though they were struggling about it. I know there's been uh, a few problems with the Hungarian referee, certainly at um, Pool in the uh, Intercontinental Final two weeks ago. Uh, you know, there's quite a few complaints that the communication wasn't good enough, but uh, they seem to have got over that. But um, what I'm a bit concerned about in this one really is um, is uh, Tony Casper because he is actually uh, should be in the rerun because I mean I, I personally think that Robert Dados was the cause of that race to be stopped. I mean he got in all sorts of tangles and I'm pretty sure that he caught uh, Tony Casper's back wheel. But uh, Tony's still up there on the track and um, a bit, I'm a bit concerned about that. Well, they're running down there with some equipment, which uh, is not, I'm not sure whether that's to repair the machinery or to repair the fence. There is a problem with the fence in that corner, which, as Sam said, is slightly different from where it is in most of the track. That's where the riders come into it. Oh, we're delighted to see that at least Tony Casper sitting up, PC, but uh, he's in pain, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, it looks as though uh, he's in a, sit a sitting position and um, possibly he's got maybe um, lower leg problems, but uh, I'm hoping he's going to get up on his feet because... Uh, he looks a very, he's a very tough lad, Tony, and he's been down a long time, but there we go. I mean, it's marvellous to see him up on his feet because, uh, to be perfectly honest, I thought it was going to be worse than that. Well, Tony Casper, he's 36 years old, and he's bouncing around, dare I say, the bouncing check as he charged into the fence there and delighted to see him up and about. And I know, Peter, that uh, you've watched him racing over the years. He's still an Eastbourne asset, and it looks as if if our referee has a bit of tolerance that even a man shaken like that will be up on his bike and back in action against Shawley. Well, I, I really thought that uh, the best thing he could have got was at least a broken leg out of that one. And to see him walking back, that's marvellous. I mean, he is a real tough character. I mean, I just don't know how he's managed to do that. Man on the left, Graham Reeve, the liaison officer, former secretary of the ACU. He's the liaison officer here for this uh, Grand Prix, and he's uh, helping things along. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, we've got track staff here. We've got all sorts of people helping here to keep this meeting swinging along but I'm sure sympathies for everybody with uh, Tony Casper and if our referee is tolerant of course he could put the riders on a two minute warning but I just wonder how patient he'd be because he knows that Casper was not at fault. I'm pretty sure that the ref's going to give him a bit more time because Tony was down there a long long time and uh, he could have easily been going off on the stretcher there Tony so I mean he's got his bike to sort out as well I'm sure his mechanics are working frantically in the pits to sort that bike but the way that bike went in the fence he's probably wrecked it so he's possibly going out on his number two bike well there we are Tony Casper look at him bouncing he's sweating like we are because it is very very hot the sun's back out on the far side of the arena the pits are very very busy it's a packed house here lovely to see it at Coventry you can see them in the background in the stands and terraces and uh, as the sun goes down and the lights come on this balmy summer's evening well it's quite a scene here at Grand Prix and uh, this is an occasion to remember and Tony Casper look they're getting his machinery ready look at him they're just feeling the pressure of the tyre cool as you like well, very, there's Casper disappearing off, you see, in the distance to the pitch. To, he's got to find a helmet, I suppose, to get on board that one. Well, he seems to be uh, walking OK, doesn't he? Had a bit of a trot there and um, no concussion. Uh... Well, we understand that he's got a few seconds more before the two-minute warning starts and Ollie Olsen, the race director in the pits, is uh, playing his part in sorting this out. But there we have Tony Casper, who we know is wearing the red helmet colour, and he will be there, and I'm sure that barring accidents with his machinery, 
Well, the courage of this man should be recognised. Remember, he has to finish in the top two in heat number six to qualify. But uh, one moment, Peter, the man that really faded was Billy Hamill. And this break, this time to get his equipment right, could really have benefited Billy Hamill more than anybody. Yeah, I, I would think that Billy Hamill and his mechanics have been frantically trying to sort those bikes out because, uh, you know, it's make or break for Billy because if he doesn't finish in the top two positions in this heat, he will be eliminated. And that would be a, one terrible turn up for him here, especially being on his home track here at Coventry and things just don't seem to be going right for him right now so I'm sure that uh, they've all got their heads together and uh, been frantically working on those machines. Well there's the time counting down bottom right hand corner of the screen of the two minutes given to the riders to get on their way to tapes that is Tony Casper now he's on the way Tony Casper and I'm sure that he will now make it to the start whether he's a bit shaken well that's another matter completely Tony Casper then the rider for whom all the weight was about going with him still in this with Robert Dados excluded we have Billy Hamill going from the outside gate in yellow and Brian Anderson the Coventry captain and track specialist he will go from gate number two they still haven't got the tapes down so the riders have had a little bit longer to go round the track and uh, get themselves uh, acclimatized and uh, our referee almost unlimited patience there he comes from Hungary wonder whether it's for the Eastern European. Does the referee favour them a little bit, Peter? Well, I think the ref's had a bit of criticism, really, and I think he's probably trying to do his best in this one. He doesn't want to be controversial, and uh, he's doing the right thing right now by allowing extra time, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that that's the right move to do. I mean, common sense has to prevail when something like this has just happened, and uh, full marks to him. I just hope he's going to keep this up for the rest of the night. There's Brian Anderson, the Coventry captain, of course, from Denmark, that goes from gate number two in this one, already up at tapes. He will be a, certainly have benefited by that time. This is heat number six. Remember, Robert Danos already out. The last rider of the three now taking part in this rerun will be eliminated. The front two, top two, will march on. And Tony Caspers, the courageous Tony Casper, certainly in the red helmet colours on the inside. That man in blue there is Brian Anderson hanging back. And on the outside, there's a gap, of course, for the excluded Robert Danos. And on the outside is Billy Hamill. There he is in yellow and black. And Billy Hamill, I just wonder, Peter, what would he have been doing during that time in the pit? Well, like I say, he's been mechanical, I'm sure. I mean, I noticed he had one Jawa and one GM machine, so he's totally undecided what he's riding at the moment. Casper Anderson, a blank space, and Hamill on the outside. Hamill looks across. Hamill looks down at the machine as it comes up. Hamill will go wide and pick up the grip. The American is back in this one with a vengeance, trying to get through. Casper closed the gate. The courageous Casper is in pole position out front, but Billy Hamill is now flying in this one. Yeah, Billy used that dirt there around the outside. He, he made a very good first turn. He used the dirt down the back straight. He rode very, very close to the fence, just squeezed through that gap there and had enough speed to go around the days. Tony Casper because I'm sure Tony's riding uh, a little bit below par at the moment, but he's really got to hold out Brian Anderson, who's, who's now having a big go on that same line as Hamill did. Anderson picking it up. He has he got time to get round there to eliminate Casper and stay in this the day. Hamill out front is going wider and wider. Anderson is now picking up the inside with a lap to go. Casper holds second place. Anderson will have another go at the back there, right-hand side of his screen. He's still trying. Away out front now in the yellow helmet colours is Billy Hamill. Hamill will go through, no problem. The Coventry fans will cheer. Tony Casper gets second place. Sadly for the lads from Coventry watching this, and sadly for the Danish supporters in blue, Brian Anderson will go out of this. But as I said at the time, the break certainly benefited Billy Hamill. It enabled him to take the chequered flag. And Billy Hamill stays in the Grand Prix with a win there in a heat six ahead of Tony Casper, who bounced up from that dreadful crash to earn second place and carry on. Disappointment for Brian Anderson, who's eliminated. But what an extraordinary train of events for heat six. And what an extraordinary turnaround for Billy Hamill. And we can see here, look at this from the start, Peter. Yeah, we can see this is the start. Billy Hamill there on the outside. He's not made the start particularly well. Uh, Tony Casper on the inside has made a great effort there in the red. You can see Tony there right in the centre of the picture. Brian Anderson's out of touch there in second place. Uh, but see Tony, he's got a great line round that first turn. But Billy Hamill, you see Billy now, he's going to squeeze down now, down that outside between the fence. His elbow's just skimming that safety fence. When he gets down to the bottom turn, He's got the fast run around the outside, just enough speed, just to sneak round the outside of Tony Casper, who's riding the inside where, the, where there is far less grip. 
Well, Tony Casper recovered, but Jonathan and Sam in the studio, I'm sure, watched that one with great interest. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't think any of us can recover. It's all going on at the moment. But I suppose the good news, Billy Hamill, he needed to be a hero tonight. I mean, it was a desperate, uh, I mean, he was so lucky that the accident happened in front of him and he had a second chance. And whatever he did in that one, I know he had his head down all the way to the corner thinking, I just got to keep going. And because he knew the track, he got by Casper. I mean, that was a pretty daring move to go all the way around the outside. And he squeezed his elbows in and made it. This is a big night for Billy. Billy's not the kind of guy that likes to be in this situation. I mean, he's pretty down right now. That should boost him up. But he should feel a bit more confident about it. Okay, well, we're all ready for the next heat. Let's go back to our commentary team. Well, a tremendous heat in prospect here in Heat 7. That's Greg Hancock, the American former world champion who rides for Coventry. The man in blue, Andy Smith, three times a British champion here on this same track. And a great ride for him, first time out, Andy Smith, when he won Heat 3. And there in the white helmet colours pulling back Mark Laram. Mark Laram was second in Heat 2, another good ride for him as well. That's two Brits on the outside in yellow and black. That is Peter Carlson on the outside. The Swede who rides for Wolverhampton in the British Elite League. There's the lineup. The American Greg Hancock from the inside gate. Two Brits, Andy Smith and Mark Moran. Peter Carlson on the outside. That's the lineup. This is Heat 7. Remember, we're now into the, getting into the serious stuff. Riders starting to be eliminated. And this is an important one for all four for a variety of reasons. And uh, for my money, well, Greg Hancock's the man to win this one, PC. Well, if Greg starts like he did in that, in that uh, last one, he's going to win this one. But of course, Andy Smith and Mark Lorimer in there, and they're both real racers. Starting Marshall moves away, the tapes go up and away on the inside goes Greg Hancock to pole position. But look at Mark Laram, they're locking up. Laram has gone round. There was contact and a half there to set Hancock back to third place. Laram was taking no prisoners, and now Hancock is going to have to battle again by Andy Smith. What a battle, what a race in second place, but what a move by Mark Laram on that first bend. Yeah, Tony, the two English boys are here. First and second, they're holding Hancock behind. Hancock's in third place. Andy Smith having a great ride there, holding Hancock behind. Behind. But of course, look at Mike Lorem, Mark Lorem out there, miles in front, really flying. Hancock's coming under the inside of Andy Smith, he's having a big blast around there. What a tremendous battle in second place. What a flyer, Mark Lorem out front. But look at these two, Andy Smith in the blue helmet colours, Greg Hancock in the red. And with a lap to go, they're going to battle for every yard behind Mark Lorem, who's going wider and faster and faster. But look at Hancock now, he's coming up the inside there. What a battle between these two track experts. The chequered flag, will it come in time for Andy Smith? Yes, it does. The Ram in white wins that ahead of Smith in blue. The two Brits mark on. Greg Hancock will have to battle again. Disappointment at the rear for Peter Carlson, but what a speedway race. Mark Moran shot away round the first bend. Then it was a battle galore between Andy Smith and Greg Hancock in second place. There are the captions to show you the results. Mark Moran and Andy Smith march on to the main event. Greg Hancock still has more to do, but that was quite a race. A marvellous ride by Laram. From the tapes, it was tough, but onto that first bend, they hit with a bang. Well, they did. Look at the start. That's Mark Lorem there in the white helmet. He doesn't quite make the start ahead of Hancock. Hancock's there in the red, right underneath him. They contact as they enter the turn. Mark pulled down there. Mark wasn't phased there. He's not worried by any rider. He looks across there at Greg Hancock. But the good thing here now for Andy Smith was there was a gap for him to go around the inside and cut on the inside of Greg Hancock. Now, Greg really is in trouble because Greg's out in no man's land and now having to face the prospect of finishing in third place. But look at Mark around there using that dirt. It's a great ride for him. He's got lots of grip as he comes out of that turn. And uh, Andy Smith tucking in behind. English boys, one, two. Great news for the Brits. Well, I can tell you the way that's worked out, Mark Laram's tremendous win gives him the doubtful reward of meeting up with Thomas Golub and Hans Nielsen in Heat 11. That's going to be some contest. Andy Smith's record takes him alongside Jimmy Nielsen and Jason Crump. But Mark Laram, we know the sort of rider he is. We have heard today that if Mario Yeru is not fit for the next round of the Grand Prix in Bidgosh, then Mark Laram will automatically go in. And on this form, we know that Mark Laram is just the man to carry the British flag. But now, as we move on to heat number eight, Lee Adams is the rider in red on the inside who won heat number two in flying style. Lee Adams, the Australian. Currently, Lee Adams, uh, not so good as he might have thought in the Grand Prix series so far, down at 11 with 25 Grand Prix points. Coming up in blue in the background, there is the Dane Brown Carga, who had to, of course, uh, move through the eliminating stages. In the white helmet colors there, it's our man Scott Nichols, so enterprising in heat number one where he came second. The 21-year-old 
of course, riding in the World Under-21 Championship next weekend. And on the outside in yellow and black, British hope Chris Louie. Two Brits, an Australian and a Dane. It's the Aussie Lee Adams on the inside of Brian Carger from Denmark. And then Scott Nichols and Chris Louie. Chris Louie, of course, the Ipswich captain. Scott Nichols from that area, but now riding down at Pool in the British Elite League. This is important for the two Brits. Are they in the right gates, PC? Yeah, this is great experience for Scott Nichols to be here in this Grand Prix. While well, starting Marshall walks away, will Nichols get a start? Louis does on the outside, they're packing into that first bend. Louis's got the line, he's gone too wide and almost into the fence at the back. But Scott Nichols is battling. Scott Nichols is there in white in second place. In red leading is the Australian Lee Adams, who will have his second successive victory on the night. But Scott Nichols is still there. The talent of this young man has shown promise. The talent of this young man could go a long, long way. But out front, Lee Adams, the Australian, riding smoothly. Carga putting the challenge on Nichols in second place. Nichols losing the grip there as Carga goes wide to pick it up. That a mistake by the young man will have to come back, PC. Yeah, there's some grip out there wide on that bottom turn where Casper crashed earlier and uh, Brian Carger used that to go by Scott Nichols. That's bad news for Scott because he looked as though he was consolidating that second place but no one's got any answer whatsoever to Lee Adams who is looking so quick tonight. And the sad part for the Brits is they are in the last two places of both Chris Louie and Scott Nichols will have to battle again but Lee Adams will march on to the main event as he takes the chequered flag in red, second place in blue, Brian Carger, Scott Nichols looks down at his machinery in white there and wonders what went wrong. And Chris Louie really there on the first bend. It was he that had a problem. And from that point of view, the Brits still have to fight. Some are going well, some not so well. A win for Lee Adams, the Australian, his second heat win ahead of Brian Carger. They move to the main event. And from their point of view, well, the Brits, who suffered a bit on the start, will have to do it all again. We've got plenty more action to come here. Eight heats have gone. But there's another 16 all to come here on Sky Sports as the action gets hotter and hotter at the Brandon Stadium here at Coventry. Dan in the pits watching what's going on down there. Kelvin's keeping an eye on what's happening up there. Me and Sam are right over the first corner. We're not missing any action. But uh, so far it's been fast and furious and we've not even got to the main event yet. But the good news is we've already got a couple of Brits through to that main event. Martin Ram's got a face Thomas Gollop straight off. I mean, there's been some big surprises in my eyes. I mean, this track is, uh, the way they started out in the meeting, obviously they didn't have things set up in practice because the first couple of races, some of the guys didn't have it together. And having that first race and having the, the, the chance to go into the next side of it um, is doing them well. What's interesting is we see uh, lots of the fans here in Britain uh, who've come to see Martin Ram. All of the riders were struggling yesterday in practice. The only rider not to ride was Andy Smith, who was who had his own uh, elite. Uh, he had his own elite match. Right. Uh, he actually got a maximum in that as well for Bellevue, so that was pretty good. But everybody came here. It was hot. It was dusty. They just watered it just before practice, and everybody came away going, "Well, I got nothing out of that." And that's maybe why there's a couple struggling. I, I've never really favored Coventry as a Grand Prix type track because there is very tight, and it is sometimes down to just making a good start. But we've seen some really good races so far, and there seems to be a lot of the guys chasing the the high line. And um, if they all chase it so early, there might not be nothing left at the end. So hopefully the graders will do a good job bringing it back. Well, out of the corner of my eye, I can see that the riders are going out for the next heat, heat nine. So let's get back to our commentary team once again of Peter Collins and Tony Millard. Yes, heats nine and ten are heats that see riders eliminated. Each the last two riders will go out, and this is going to be important. That man in blue there is Tony Casper, who was shaken with that uh, effort, I can tell you. And uh, Tony Casper has stormed back into this one. Well, Mark Laram's with Kelvin Tatum in the pits, and Mark Laram is the man of the moment. Mark Laram's with Kelvin, I think. That's right. Uh, joining me now is Mark Laram. Perfect ride in the last ride. He got away. Hard first corner, um, but uh, looked like you, um, uh, you know, you, your bike setup was perfect. Yeah, I mean, it's so much difference when you get out in front, you know, get a bit of fresh air on your goggles and you can ride the line you want and get as good speed. The first race, I didn't feel very special, but like I say, you know yourself, when you get out in front, it's, it makes a difference. Yeah, perfect ride. We'll, we'll talk to you later on, hopefully. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Okay, Mark Laram, of course, destined perhaps for future greatness in the Grand Prix 
and destined perhaps to take part in the next two even though he's only a wild card this now is heat number nine where two will go and we hope they won't be one of the Brits which is Chris Louis who we see on the left hand side of your camera there on the outside on the inside Henrik Gustafsson from Sweden gate two is Tony Kasper the shaken Czech who bounced around the circuit Greg Hancock on his home track will be looking for better and Chris Louis the Ipswich and Great Britain captain goes from the outside we're desperate for Chris Louis to get a good start here starting Marshall moves away they look down of course on the inside there in white Hancock gets to the apex of the bend Louis is going to pick the outside and pick up the grip and does to move smoothly into second place with a touch on the way with Henry Gustafsson can Louis keep it Gustafsson is going wide Hancock is going fast out front Gustafsson's going to take it wider Louis is going to have to watch the Swede behind him back in third place is Casper who looks to be out of this one but Hancock in front it's the two in second and third Peter are battling yeah, Chris Louis has got to move out because uh, Gustafsson's having that big go round the outside. Greg Hancock's having a great run now. He's no idea of all the pandemonium and chaos that's going on behind him. Chris Louis now consolidating that second place. Gustafsson now seems to have given up the challenge, Tony. Yeah, way at the back in blue is Tony Casper. He's going to go out. Louis with a lap to go has a 20 metre advantage over Henry Gustafsson. Greg Hancock is going to be the favourite of the Coventry fans here as the former world champion marches on. He's had his problems. They haven't gone the way he might have done many times. But now he's got time to look back. And as he looks back, he sees Chris Louis in his wake. Further back is Henrik Gustafsson in red who goes out. And so too does a disappointed but heroic Tony Casper. We know that Chris Louis is now through to the main event. We know that Greg Hancock, the former world champion, is through as well. Gustafsson and Casper, they have to depart. They can go home early. Heat nine, as they say, perhaps has shorted out the sheep from the goats. But really, well, Greg Hancock is a super rider. Yeah, on the start, Hancock made a perfect start. I mean, he was totally out there like a scalded cat. You see on the outside, Chris Louis, we're following him round that first turn. Now Chris is in third place at this point. There's Gustafsson on the inside. Now Henker doesn't realise that Chris Louis is coming because when Chris gets alongside Gustafsson, Gustafsson had a terrible shot there as Chris Louis sailed down the outside run along that fence and uh, he generally consolidated that race as he carried on. Gustafsson at this point looks as though he's going to get round the outside of everybody but not enough speed, not enough grip out there. But uh, what a start, what a ride from Greg Hancock. I mean, really, that's exactly what he needed and just what he needed right now. Well, certainly it was for Greg Hancock. Another disappointing Grand Prix has ended for Hendrik Gustafsson, who has so frequently promised so much. But no disappointment for Greg Hancock. The former world champion is through to the main event. And I can tell you from his point of view, well, it's going to be far from easy as they battle on. He will be matching up against Stefan Dano and Ron Sullivan in heat 13 but heat number 10 again is coming up now and this is one that'll again separate and that man there Billy Hamill will want to emulate his countryman his pal and his fellow Exide rider in qualifying by the back door as you might say and what has Billy Hamill got to do this time Peter? Oh I don't know Tony he seems to be hanging on there by the skin of his teeth he really struggled he was very lucky to get through in that last one and uh, here he is now this is an elimination heat because uh, second and third here, sorry, third and fourth here are going to go out of this Grand Prix. So he's got to be in the first two and uh, Scott Nichols is in there. So I suppose I might be shouting for Scott a little bit. While the two Carlson brothers, if they get to the apex of the bend first, I'm sure there'll be some team riding there with them both together in this one. But uh, certainly it's going to be a battle royal in this one. And we are cheering, of course, for Scott Nichols, the youngster in the white helmet colours there pulling back who did so well to start with, but I think was caught by, well, the old three-car trick, if you like, in his second race when he was passed on the outside with a fast line. Billy Hamill goes from the inside in red. In gate two, it's Michael Carlson in blue. Scott Nichols goes in white, and Peter Carlson from the outside goes in yellow and black. The Carlson brothers who ride for Sweden, they ride for Wolverhampton, and separated by us by initials, sadly not on our captions for the moment. Billy Hamill and Scott Nichols. Billy Hamill, of course, a Coventry rider here. They look across to the magnets. Oh, and Scott Nichols will go out of this one, I'm sure, for touching the tapes. And sadness for the youngster, because it's exclusion for Scott Nichols. It's hardly disappointing. It could hardly be more disappointing. And look at that, Peter. Was it nerves for the young man? Well, we can see uh, Scott Nichols' left hand there. He's got two fingers taped together. Now, that could be part of his problem because uh, that broken bone in his hand is on his clutch hand. So basically he's having to use that hand all the time. He's having to hold on to that clutch. And I think he felt that he got to the point where he was going to let that clutch go. 
and then hold on to the bar but of course he was too soon and uh, he's off back to the pit and his meeting's over and, and that's a sad thing because uh, I think that's quite a bit down to this injury that he's carrying Tony while he was talking to us yesterday about that he showed us the hand he thought the doctor may not even pass him fit to race but the doctor did say he could race did say he could make the practice and well this was his first ever Grand Prix it started so well but it's ended in disappointment I think we should explain for our viewers that if you touch the tapes it's automatic exclusion these days and the referee Isvan Durago from Hungary had no option than to put Scott Nichols out yeah I, I did sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek suggest that uh, Scott possibly could put the uh, clutch lever on his throttle hand and work the two with the one hand but uh, I don't think he fancied that too much, Tony. Redesigning the bike and mechanics of Peter Collins. I can tell you that Scott Nichols is in the World Under-21 Championships at Boyens next weekend. And there is another meeting alongside that, which is a pairs event. And Peter Collins is partnering Mark Laram. Peter, what do we feel like to be back in the saddle? Oh, terrified, Tony. I'm not looking forward to it at all. But I uh, suppose when you get on the bike, everything comes back. Or certainly I hope it's going to anyway. But... I probably won't be riding around at the front, Tony, that's for sure. We've seen some big adverts around this track about a, a video called the College Boys as well. That shows Peter through the years. I'm sure that those memories will come flooding back at Boyens at the weekend. We're waiting for the starting tanks to be put into shape here after Scott Nichols hit them here. A reminder, just three riders remain in this heat. Ten, Scott Nichols has already gone out. And one of three, Billy Hamill, Michael Carlson and Peter Carlson will all go out in this one. The first two will march on to the main event and the last man of the three will go. This is heat number 10, the restart with Scott Nichols crashing out of course, or not crashing out, going into the tapes and being excluded by our referee. Remember, in the early part of the event, we have 24 riders in the Grand Prix, 16 start in the first four heats. Eight remain after this heat number 10 to join the eight seeded riders. They're the top dogs. Starting Marshall walks away and looking across is Billy Hamill, he rears again and now he's got work to do behind Michael Carlson in front. Back at the rear is Peter Carlson in yellow. Peter Carlson's got a mechanical problem and this means that Billy Hamill will go through. Peter Carlson at the back is out of this. The other two will have to race each other only for position of gates, I have to tell you. And in whatever heat these two go in, they will be going in the outside two gates because that's the way it works out. But Michael Carlson in front of Billy Hamill. And Hamill, who started so badly at the night, Peter Carlson is going to use half of that behind. But it's all going to come well for Billy Hamill, Peter. Yes, uh, Michael Carlson's looking very, very good up there front, but Billy Hamill seems to be getting things together now. It looks as though he's riding the Jawa machine in this bike, and uh, it is looking a, a lot better than it was early on, but he really has got to go a little bit quicker than this if he's going to qualify for the later stages of the meeting. Well, I was talking to Billy Hamill just before the start, and he said he had been riding Jawa, but was going tonight on GMs. Well, he suffered problems right at the start with those, and now with a chequered flag, well, no such problem for him in second place here. He goes through to the main event. The man in blue in front of him, Michael Carlson, has time to look back. It means that Michael Carlson and Billy Hamill will go on to the main event. It means sadness for Peter Carlson, who will disappear. And uh, Michael Carlson then, and Billy Hamill to the main event. Peter Carlson goes home with the excluded rider, Scott Nichols. The main event is still to follow. The crowd hasn't moved an inch. It's a tremendous night here for the British Grand Prix at Coventry. And we've got another 14 heats of action still to come. Welcome back to Coventry. This is the man that everybody's waiting to ride. The great Thomas Golub of Poland. He's won two Grand Prix already. He leads the World Championship and he's in the main event. No surprise there. And Britain's best rider, I guess, Mark Laram, is going to be up against him as is Hans Nielsen. Last year, right at the back last year in the Grand Prix here, gate three was probably the favorite gate. It was when it come down to Ryan Sullivan and Jason Crump flipping the coin. Jason got gate three and he won it. And as we're coming up now. And we can see just quickly who's been eliminated already. And I suppose no big surprises there. Scott Nichols is a bit of a shame because I think he's riding better than that. And there was a couple of mistakes there really for him. Anton Kasper, well, we saw what happened there. And Hedrick Gustafsson, I suppose, big surprise. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're all fighters. Most of those guys are really good racers. But the track probably didn't lend to it today. And, uh, you know, they had to make the start and they didn't do it. You know, like I said, when we're getting into what gate positions are pretty important at the moment, you know. I mean, Mark Laram's at the top of that side there, and Mark Laram's got gate uh, three in his in the first race of the main event against uh, Thomas Golub and Hans Nielsen. 
Well, it's great news for the Brits, especially Andy Smith. Andy Smith had a quick uh, walk past us a minute ago and gave us the old, yeah, he's enjoying yeah. this. He had a maximum yesterday. The guy's on a real high. Yeah, I mean, it's, the, the small track, Bellevue is a bit of a small track like Coventry here. So, you know, if he can get out of the start, his bikes look pretty fast out there. So he looks like he's pretty set up for it. So he should have a good chance. Well, there's plenty of Brits still riding. The main event's just about to get underway. So let's go to our commentary team of Peter Collins and Tony Millard. Well, the greats come together here, and none is greater in Britain at the moment than this man, Mark the Ram. You see in your camera there wearing the white helmet colour in this heat. But look at the man in the background there. That is Thomas Golob, the man they all want to beat, the highest paid sportsman in Poland. I was reading today, he thought of in Poland like Alan Shearer is in England. That's Hans Nielsen, of course, multi-world champion. Aiming to retire this year. Some people believe that he won't, perhaps, but we'll have to wait and see. He goes, uh, if, well, whether he goes to the Grand Prix Challenge or qualifies for next year's Grand Prix, I just wonder whether he will carry on riding. Mark Ram in white there, and the man in yellow and black is the Dane Brian Cargo. What about that man, Hans Nielsen, Peter? Will he retire after all? Well, it's a difficult one to say. I think he's playing his cards pretty close to his chest at the moment. I know he has said this uh, on numerous occasions earlier this year, but uh, it's not been mentioned for a while. So, you know, maybe, maybe thinking about having another go next year. Well, you know, we talked about him in the uh, previous Grand Prix when he held back from first place. And I did actually ask him about whether it was choice of gates. And he was planning. We were talking with Ivan Major, who said that's what he used to do. And Mark Laram knew full well in Rotslav that uh, gate positions were important. And that's exactly what he did. Well, there is Mark Laram. And he's got a lot to do in this one. But gate three will probably help him. Thomas Golob on the inside. I have a feeling that Golob really prefers the wider gate, Peter. Yeah, we know he loves the outside, and there is a lot of dirt out wide on the turns. Thomas loves it out there, but he's pinned down on gate one. But gate one's quite a good starting position, and the way Thomas rides, he can make it from anywhere. You know, he really is world champion uh, material, and we've seen him so many times, he can pull something very, very special out the hat at the last minute. I know the riders, though, don't like going outside Thomas Goller, but there's three men outside, and this time as Jimmy Nielsen watches with interest as what's going to happen. There's Greg Hancock in the background, and now... This is the time. This is Mark Aram, and we desperately want him to finish in the first two. He will get another chance if he doesn't. We're through to the main event, remember. The eight qualifiers from the first ten heats are joining the eight seeded riders. There's the lineup. Thomas Goller from Poland on the inside. Hans Nielsen from Denmark goes from gate two, three times the world individual champion. Mark Aram, already a Grand Prix winner this year in white from Britain, goes from gate three. And Brian Karg, the unfancied Dane, perhaps. The 15 seconds, there's the time. Up in front of the riders, you can't back away from this now. And gate two, the most popular for victory so far there. We see the 40%, the others shared equally. The starting marshal holds them up here now. The starting marshal Norman Keatley marches away. Up go the tapes and away on the inside goes Gollum. But look at Nielsen, look at the Ram. The Ram's going through. Gollum is right at the back. Oh, he made a big mistake there now. And the all-conquering pole will have an awful lot to do. But a brilliant bend by Mark Laram. And Hans Nielsen, the veteran, is like his former self here now. Yeah, we know Hans can have his moments when he makes a good start, a good corner. And Mark Laram's really having a go in. Pulls alongside of Hans Nielsen. Mark Laram looking brilliant in this one. Thomas Gollop will have to go again. But Hans Nielsen leading Mark Laram. We know the class. We know the speed. We know the ability of Mark Laram. And we know the finesse of the professor in front as Hans Nielsen leads this one. We're talking about his retirement, but if he can ride like this, beating some of the best riders in the world with a lap to go. Hans Nielsen may be a veteran, but the speedway skills are there. It's time to look back. He sees in his wake Mark Laram, who's having another go on the inside. What a tremendous ride by the Brit. But Kao, look at it, Laram wins it. Oh, and Nielsen shuts off again, and I just wonder if that was tactical because Mark Laram won it third in yellow. There was Brian Carger, but Mark Laram took in a pan of Hens Nielsen, and I just wonder, this is something for the lads in the pits and the studio to talk about because yet again, Hans Nielsen has shut off just before the line to give the victory to Mark Laram. And what a tremendous ride by Mark Laram. And really, it will need some calculations. There's Mark Laram, the winner, ahead of Hans Nielsen and Brian Carger. But I just wonder, because the second rider in Heat 10 will go from Gate 3 in Heat 14 against Ricardson and Screen, and that's what Nielsen has earned for himself. Yeah, Tony, this is the start. There's Hans in the blue helmet. He wills that bike to the first turn. Now Thomas Golob on the inside. Thomas makes a good start. Now, because he's come from the inside start position, he's had to turn very sharp. You can see that point there. He's almost going backwards. That's where he lost the race. 
and Hans Nielsen goes around the outside. Thomas now is struggling. He went from almost first to last, and that's where he stayed. But Mark Laram there in the white helmet stalked and chased Hans Nielsen for the whole race, tried everything he knew. Hans Nielsen held off. But uh, there on the inside is Brian Carger. Now, this is the last turn. We spoke to Hans Nielsen yesterday, and Hans said he's done this before. Let the rider ahead uh, go by him so he gets a better start position. Well, there's more to come, but the talking point from that heat was Hans Nielsen again shutting off. Sam Malenko in our studio, I'm sure we'll have an opinion on that. He's done it before, and he'll probably do it again. Sam, what about that? Well, I tell you what, I was just saying there, we didn't have time to fit it all in there, but I think gate three is going to be the best gate position. And uh, the guys are working it out. I mean, Greg's on gate three in his next one. Lee Adams on it in this next race. Um, that's probably going to be the favorite gate. I was here a couple of weeks ago in a league match, and gate three won every start. I know that the percentages probably say one thing or the other, but, I mean, as the, as the meeting goes on, I think it's going to be the best one. We can see the fastest heat times. No surprises there. And it's the men that you were mentioning there who are leading those times as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's real important right now to really think about the final couple of races. And right now, when it gets tougher, as you see, Golob, he didn't make the best to start, but it just depends on who you're, who's on the inside of you. Yeah, he's a smart old cookie, old Hans Nielsen. He knew it all along, but Laram wins the heat. Let's get back to the action with our commentary team. Well, I have to tell you, I was talking at practice with Hans Nielsen just about that yesterday with Ivan Major, one of the greatest, and that's what they do. Here's the lineup, heat 12. Jimmy Nielsen currently second in the Grand Prix standings. Jason Crump goes from gate two, winner of the British Grand Prix here last year. Lee Adams, winner of heat one tonight. The Australian goes from gate three. And Andy Smith, three times the British champion on this very track, goes from the outside. This is heat 12, a real cracker in prospect here. I just wonder if Andy Smith on the outside can spring a surprise. I hope so. Andy can blast around that inside. I'm really hoping he can do that but I'm looking at Jimmy Nielsen on the inside because we've just seen what happened to Tom Thomas Golub down there and it did not work for him. They look across to the tapes a little bit of creeping by Jimmy Nielsen who actually made the game brilliantly there but he was by anticipation. Nielsen out front will go armchair style from here coming around the outside in blue Jason Crump will chase him all the way Andy Smith is back in third place Lee Adams the Aussie is in fourth but a brilliant start by Jimmy Nielsen albeit with a bit of anticipation and chasing him all the way is Jason Crump Getting in on the act now is Andy Smith. There's two and a half laps to go. Smith has a bit to do, but Nielsen is safe out front. Oh, Jimmy Nielsen was so clever there on that first turn. He made a perfect start. He rolled very, very tight round the inside. And when he, when he came out of that first turn, he was 10 metres in front. I mean, that's unbelievable because that isn't the quick way round on that first turn. But he made it look so good. He's making it look so good now as he's pulling away from the rest of the field. And Andy Smith is trying there as we go into the last lap in second place to put the pressure on Jason Crump but Crump will surely hold it firm. At the moment out front, Jimmy Nielsen is going to win this by some 20 metres to march on Jimmy Nielsen. He takes that with some comfort. Second place goes to Jason Crump in blue. Those two march on to what are the effective quarterfinals. The other two will have to come back, Lee Adams and Andy Smith, to hold their place in the Grand Prix. But it was a brilliant ride by Jimmy Nielsen ahead of last year's Grand Prix winner here, Jason Crump. And Jimmy Nielsen's start was oh so important in that one. It's been interesting to look at here, Peter, but we look at the outside man, Andy Smith. Jimmy Nielsen crept on the inside. Yeah, Andy seems to lift there on the start. He's got the front wheel off the ground, but just look at Jimmy Nielsen. He's made a great start. He's not a long way in front when he gets to the corner. That's Jason Crump riding wide for the dirt. Jason thinks that's the quickest way round. This is Jason's first ride on the Hagen Shocks. Uh, GM there but right around the inside Jimmy Nilsson he's already steamed off down that back straight and he's 10 yards in front when he gets to the bottom turn there he is a commanding lead and uh, the best job in Speedway is the person who cleans Jimmy's leathers because starting like that he just never gets them dirty well, we're moving on a pace now with that win for Jimmy Nielsen, keeping him in contention in the Grand Prix and moving on now to heat number 13. And this is going to be important in more ways than one as we look across at the lineup here. And uh, certainly from uh, Billy Hamill's point of view coming out in this one, that man in blue there is uh, Ron Sullivan, the Australian. Certainly Ron Sullivan has been impressive and uh, the moment lying 13th in the Grand Prix his best Grand Prix of course the last one in Rotslav so far there's uh, Greg Hancock already up at takes in the white helmet colors on the 
inside in red, Stefan Dano. We've talked about him as being a surprise packet. Currently lying fourth in the Grand Prix Series. I have to tell you, he's not going to ride in the British League for the rest of the season, but he did tell me that he's going to come back and ride in the British Elite League next season properly prepared. And that'll be good news to Eastbourne fans if he goes down there again. But it's uh, two meetings so far in this country. A little bit disappointing, but not in the Grand Prix. Just riding Grand Prix or Swedish League matches for the rest of the season. That's an unusual choice, Peter. Most riders wide wherever they can. That's right. Um, Stefan, <laughs> it's interesting to see that Stefan's on that inside position as well. There he is, right down by the kerb. And uh, let's just see if uh, he can make the same job as Jimmy Nielsen did, because that was very, very impressive from Jimmy Nielsen. And Stefan's ready there on the start, but on the outside, we've got the two Americans who both ride here for Coventry in the Elite League on this track. Greg Hancock, Billy Hamill. Well, Stanley Marshall moves away. The two Americans who ride for Coventry are certainly in the battle, but look at them going right as they swap places there. Hancock, oh, mayhem! The two Americans are left here. Dano and Sullivan carved into each other. It'll be an interesting decision by our referee here, Isfan Dorago, on this one, and we'll have to see what happened here because it was chaos. Look at it. Yeah, Stefan Dano actually took a bit more drive there and rode right into Ryan Sullivan. Stefan, I think, was at fault there, and uh, the referee, if, if there's going to be something happening here with regarding a disqualification, then Dano, I think, would be excluded. But the Americans, Hancock and Hamill, also crashed, but uh, you've got to feel a bit there for Ryan Sullivan because I think he was the innocent party. We can see Dano in the red. Dano just tends to come, straightens up at that point and runs into the line of Ryan Sullivan and down both... Uh, Sullivan and uh, Dano into the fence. Well, it looked to us then from that replay that Stefan Dano was the prime cause of the stoppage, taking away the front wheel of Ryan Sullivan. I don't know whether that'll be the verdict of our referee. We'll have to see. Well, tension here on the rider. And again, the first aid staff okay. have to come out to that. Well, it was quite spectacular there. And for my money, certainly Dano was the cause of the stoppage. Problems for Ryan Sullivan's machinery problems for Dano's machinery and I just wonder what our referee's decision will be uh, machinery has to go back there's Ron Sullivan getting to his feet and uh, well we can go to our studio and I wonder what the lads have to think about that do you agree with Stefan Dano's fault Sam well well, well I, I you know it's first turn bunching I think I mean they're both trying to race when you're on the inside and he didn't really have a superb gate on him, but he was had a chance to move him out a little bit. And basically, I just think he, he did, I think he tried to give him a little bit of a room. At the same time, he got a little bit of drive. Well, Jason Crump's also here. You were watching that closely, Jason. What did you see? Well, it's just difficult to say. Like Sam said, it's the first turn. First turns are very important. You don't want to give too much room away. As a two-time winner of this particular Grand Prix, you know this track very well, obviously. What are the, uh, the track conditions like at the moment? Well, with the weather being so warm, they're a little bit slicker than I anticipated. But, um, you know, like I say, with the hot weather, they have, they've done a great job on the track. It's been very difficult for them, but a little bit slicker than I would have hoped, really. Well, let's take a look at what just happened. I mean, all four riders really involved in this, and we can see it again. The two Americans bucking Brocken as well. Yeah, they were. Um, they were getting a bit out of control there together, but uh, Ryan and Dano just, just touched there, going for the dirt line coming out of the corner, and, uh, you know, it's just possibly nobody's fault, just hard racing. That's a, that's a problem with this kind of a track. I mean, it is a very narrow track, and then when you get into the corner, it opens up. So the boys tend to think that there's a chance to keep going, but then it also funnels back, doesn't it, it Jason? It does. Coming out of the corners, the fence comes back quite sharply, especially, especially, especially on right the second there, yeah. Band, yeah, Right there where they just hit you, the wall. You anticipate there's a lot of room, and then all of a sudden there's um, not a lot of room left at all. Jason, a quick go word about your particular Grand Prix. A big note for you. You've had so much great success. I know it's your birthday next week. And I know that this particular venue and this Grand Prix has great memories for you. How are you feeling? How's the setup for tonight? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Um, you know, home's half an hour away, so I enjoy coming here for the Grand Prix. You know, we just use our normal base, normal, normal race preparation, and uh, it's good fun. Well, as we can see, Ryan Sullivan hobbling back. Not a good scene for him. No, not at all. What, what happens, Jason, now? I mean, these guys come here. I mean, I know everybody's trying to be prepared, but it looked like Daniel's bike was damaged and possibly Ryan's bike. I mean, are you prepared with two bikes if something like this was to happen? Yeah, I was a bit, um, had a bit of a difficult practice session yesterday, Sam. I had to toss a coin to decide which bike to ride. <laughs> what, um, a good, what a good feeling. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often, as you know, but um, I was really pleased with that. And um, knowing Ryan's set up, he'll have another bike there ready to go. Yeah, he seems to be smiling, so they seem to be in control of what they're doing. They know what's going on, yeah. Yeah. Well, Jason, best of luck for the rest of the evening. We'll be seeing you in action, I'm sure, in a few moments' time. Thanks. But uh, See you, while we're waiting for the restart of what was, uh, well, amazing mayhem at the uh, end of that last one or at the beginning of that last one, 
It looks as though Ryan Sullivan is uh, hobbling back and getting himself sorted out. Let's go back to our commentary team once again. Well, as we look down at the track here, quite spectacular, the Brandon Circuit. I can tell you they're introducing go-kart racing on that centre green, which is all concrete. We saw some spectacular stuff, car driving earlier on, rapid parking. That man in blue, Ron Sullivan, another one shaken by that little contretemps with Stefan Dano. All four riders back in, Stefan Dano in the red helmet colour, will a go from the inside. There he is in the background, you see Stefan Dano going through. And a referee does have options, Peter Collins, but there, do you think he exercised it correctly? Well, I, I, it's touch and go. I mean, those first corner incidents, they're always uh, debatable, but I, I tended to feel the views that we saw um, of that incident. I really did feel that Stefan was, Stefan Dano was to blame for that. He kind of went offline at the very last minute and took uh, Ryan Sullivan's front wheel away, and uh, Ryan went down heavily, and it, I think it was Stefan's fault. I have to tell you, we have just seen the most extraordinary situation down the side track here, with spare bikes being taken down towards the start for both Billy Hamill and Greg Hancock, who are out on the track now in this one, but spare machinery by their mechanics waiting at the end of the straight. Now, I haven't seen that before. It's an interesting manoeuvre. I think they felt, well, it takes too long to get spare bikes from the pits, so they're going to be ready this time. Well, Billy's already had that problem, hasn't he, in that first one. Uh, he couldn't get his spare bike down quickly enough and was excluded. So they've got, uh, you know, they've got bikes down there already but I mean it's a desperate move you know when they've got to do this because they must be having trouble well that's unusual for those two lads who are normally so well prepared but there's the lineup for the restart Stefan Dana from Sweden on the inside Ron Sullivan goes from gate two in blue the Australian the two Americans both of whom ride here at Coventry Greg Hancock and Billy Hamill go from the outside two gates and I'm sure all the riders will be hoping that well it's not quite like last time there we see the success from the start positions Gate two, the most successful so far. That a little bit unusual. Our Starling Marshall walks away. Here we go for the restart. Up go the tapes. Dano looks down at his machinery. Coming across well, Hancock in white. Picking it up on the outside, Billy Hamill in yellow. He's left no space at all as Dano comes across. Going through in blue is Ron Sullivan. Now the battle is joined. The gate shut well and truly on Hamill, who now has to battle from the back. But Hancock's got a fire out front. Interesting tactics on that bit. Oh, there's some great racing here going on, Tony, but... Greg Hancock's made the start and he's away, he's got a good lead, but behind him there's all kinds going on because uh, Billy Hamill's at the back having a big run around the outside of Ryan Sullivan. Ryan was up to second place at one point, now he's back in third. Stefan Dano's back into second place. There's all kinds going on here out on the track, Tony. Hamill almost up against the fence there. Sullivan up against the back of Stefan Dano. Hancock in no trouble out front with a lap to go. Hancock is wheel perfect on this one. In second place at the moment is Stefan Dano, but it's not all over yet. Ron Sullivan storms through on the inside there to take Dano wide. Dano will try to come back. Hamill's out of this. Here comes Dano again, but Hancock holds it. And just on the line, Sullivan gets there in second place in blue with Stefan Dano. Really in third place there in red. Greg Hancock out front in white. That was perhaps the race of the evening. That man, Greg Hancock, took the chequered flag. We'll be delighted with that because he got away from the mayhem. But the action for the minor placings was quite obscene in some way. Hancock, Sullivan, Dano the finishing order. Dano and Hamill will have to go again. Greg Hancock and Ron Sullivan will march on from this Heat 13. Oh, what a fantastic race there. Greg Hancock makes the perfect start in the white. He's out of the picture. You can see his back wheel accelerating away. That on the inside is Stefan Dano. Stefan's made a good first turn. There's Ryan Sullivan on the SVR dirt track team machine. And uh, he rode very, very well, Ryan, because at one point he was actually second. He went back to last place and then he finished up in second. So he had a great ride in there. And Stefan Dano was mixing it as well. So the two boys that had the very, very bad crash seem to be showing no after effects of that. There's Ryan Sullivan tucking in the second place. Billy Hamill at the back, very uncharacteristic for him. Now this is the last turn, Stefan Dano's trying everything, so much grip over the line, shunting into the side of Ryan Sullivan, but Ryan did it just enough to stay ahead, and uh, there's Ryan Sullivan coming from last position, right up to second, he gets the wheels in line so early, he gets a great run down that back straight, so much speed, he's riding down the inside of the straight where there's a lot of dirt down there, but when he gets to the turn, he has to turn very sharp. Well, the action is tending to build up here. It really is moving with a vengeance. And uh, Chris Louie there we see going out. We'll be wearing the yellow helmet colours in this one. The man, there's world champion Tony Rickardson on the inside in red there. The man in white already up at tapes. That is Michael Carlson. 
and uh, certainly there's going to be another battle here each and every heat now peter seems to be really something pretty special there's a problem there for tony ricardson signaling towards the pits now he has machine problems i wonder how much is it due to the intense heat here tonight Whoa, I couldn't say about that. I mean, Tony's been going so well of late. I mean, he's been breaking track records all over the show. He got 17 at Bellevue uh, only two weeks ago. And uh, he is the man on form right now in Sweden. He's been knocking at least a second off track records over there. And he's come good just at the right time. But it looks as though it's just a clutch problem here. He's tightening the springs on the clutch. Nothing serious. He wants to make sure he's got enough pressure on those clutch plates when he drops that clutch on that inside start position because it's so critical that he makes a good start from there because we've seen what happened to Thomas Golob. Well, there in the yellow helmet colours, Chris Louie goes from the outside. On the inside, it's Tony Rickardson in red, the world champion. Joe Screen, Britain's hope, goes from gate two in blue, his first ride of the night. On Michael Carlson, gate three, Chris Louie on the outside, away they go, picking it up is Rickardson out front, going very, very wide is Chris Louie, and then diving through the inside, and again, the competition in second, third and fourth places is intense behind Tony Rickardson out front. Rickardson picks up the line, but look at this right now from Joe Screen going round the outside, and Screen is going to catch Tony Rickardson down that back straight. What a battle here. Yeah, Joe's riding the line that he likes best, the outside run. There's some grip out here wide. But they're all using it except Rickardson. Rickardson got a good line round that bottom turn there. Got a slight advantage. Screen, he realises now that he's probably got to settle for second place, which probably wouldn't be a bad thing at this moment. With just over a lap to go, Tony Rickardson now has opened up that gap. He's picked his own racing line. He knows where he's going as we go into the last lap with Joe Screen in second place. If he holds it here, the Brit will march on. Back in third place is Michael Carlson. Another disappointment for Chris Louis. He's going to have to come back again, but he's done it before tonight. Rickardson wins it in red ahead of the man in blue there in second place, Joe Screen. Disappointment for Chris Louis, but certainly, well... There, Tony Rickardson shows the class, and Michael Carlson, the man getting third place there in the white helmet colours, ahead of Chris Louie. Carlson and Louie will have to battle again, but Tony Rickardson and Joe Screen march on. The world champion there in red, from the gate, made it all the way in that heat to take himself on. And really, there's plenty more action coming. Ten more heats of frenetic speedway here at the Brandon Stadium in this, the British... Welcome back to a balmy evening at Brandon in Coventry. It's the British Grand Prix, and we're well into it. These are the scenes from the pits, and we're here just above that, only about 15 yards away. We can hear the bikes revving up, can't we, Sam? That's a great place to be for a Grand Prix. That's perfect. we got the best seat in the house, yeah, I think. No question about it. Great to see uh, Joe Screen riding well. Interesting, the line he chose very much on the outside. Ricardson very much on the inside. I mean, Tony knew exactly what he had to do, and I tell you, uh, this track, I mean, Ryan rode the best line in the race before that when he passed Stefan Daniel. Stefan Daniel chose to stay on the outside, and I think Tony seen that, and he just stuck right on the inside. Joe had everything to go for. He had to make sure he got that second spot, and he had Michael Carlson, which is an outside rider, so they're both you know, race chasing the same line. So, I mean, uh, Joe had only one place to go, and that's where he feels comfortable. Tough question, Sam, but at this stage in the Grand Prix, who's looking good, who's looking hot, who's looking to make that A final? You know, the sneaky guy that always seems to do well and has made, I think, almost every uh, final so far is Jimmy Nielsen. He's doing, uh, he just snuck in there and won the first one. Um, I think the other guys, nobody's really paid attention to Jimmy at this stage because um, all the excitement's been afterwards. And, but in his first race off the inside, he looked so smooth and dominating. Well, I can tell you, Jimmy Nielsen was looking cool, calm, and collected. You remember we saw him in the Elite League on Wednesday. He was on flying form and was ready at that point, so even four days ago. He is the only rider to make all three um, uh, finals, so A finals so far. So if he stays in contention and Golub has a bad meeting, he's got everything to win here. Yeah, Golub and Nielsen, it looks, will take it all the way to the wire in this championship. Let's go back to our commentary team as we start our next heat. Remember, heats 15 and 16 are heats that see two more riders eliminated from each and four more go out as we build up to the climax of this British Grand Prix. We said earlier it's mighty hot, it's mighty humid, and the crowd here in their shirt sleeves are certainly enjoying it. They're battling in the pits, mechanics, team managers and riders alike all playing their part. In heat 15, of course, Chris Louie goes from the outside gate, and it's going to be tough for Chris Louie. Here we see there looking down at his machinery. There is Chris Louie doing his own clutch repairs. 
and really not relying on mechanics PC, he wants it just his way. Well, when it comes down to a clutch, that's a very personal part of the bike. That's your contact with your bike onto the track, and uh, Chris knows that he wants it just how he wants it. You can't expect a mechanic to do that exactly how you want it, and he's in there. He's now doing the adjustment on the cable. He's just checking the clearance in that. Well, the referee's put him on two minutes, so he's got to move towards the tapes here because there's going to be something wrong if he doesn't get there and uh, Chris Louie is taking all his time and I worry for him that the referee will exclude him we, we haven't seen the clock for the moment on this countdown but the referee has put him on two minutes the flashing light is going and Chris Louie has an awful lot to do to get there still I just wonder if he'll make it well it's a long way isn't it to the uh, to the starting gate they've got to run right round the outside of that runoff stock car area to get right round to that gate at the opposite end of the circuit so it's a long long way round and uh, he's having to uh, really rush now he's onto the bike he's putting the cut out the cut out there onto his hand that's his father John there with him well, there's the countdown. There is the clock now from our referee. Brings him less than a minute to get on his way to tapes here at Coventry. He's got a fair way to go down this track. Right, the lineup is going to be tight here. Chris Louis has to go from the outside. That gate not going too well at the moment. On the inside will be Brian Carger. There is Louis making his way to tapes. In gate two will be Stefan Dano, who we thought perhaps might have been excluded for the contraton with uh, Ryan Sullivan in his first outing. The man in blue. Stefan Dano coming up to tapes now to go alongside this man. We see Stefan Dano there in the background. Brian Carger trying to make tracks, giving himself a little bit of extra grip. There is Dano going from gate two, the Swede who currently lies fourth in the Grand Prix series. The man in white there is Lee Adams, the Australian. He's 11th at the moment with 25 Grand Prix points. And on the outside is Chris Louie. That's the lineup. Carger on the inside, Dano gate two. Lee Adams goes from gate three, Chris Louis from the outside. Louis needs to make the start here, Peter. He does, he's got to make it because this is an elimination heat and if he's not in the first two, he'll be back to the pits, back to the showers and home in his van. Sardi Marshall moves away, the riders look across. Louis keeps it down, but he's trailing here. Will he come round? He's got oh, a lovely move by Chris Louis. He watched, he waited, and then he went, and he's done it well here behind Lee Adams. Chris Louis saw something we didn't on that first bend, took a totally different line, held back and cut through the inside. But now, look, he's been passed by Brian Carger, and now Louis's got to do it all over again. He's got a race as the British captain here now. Out front in white is Lee Adams, ahead of the rider in red, Brian Carger. But look at the action here, and now Louis right at the back what's gone wrong for the Brit yeah Chris did all the work on that first lap he went up to second place that qualifying position but then he just doesn't seem quick enough he's used that inside line again we know he rides very very good round the inside line he's using it again but when he gets to the straight he just hasn't got the speed but it at least he's in pursuit now of Brian Carger, but he's got one more lap to do it, and it's looking slim for him right now. Lee Adams looks back. Chris Louis will have to battle the action in second place. Chris Louis, can he come through? It's all. Oh, is he going to do it? Yes, he's done it. Chris Louis, he could hardly have left it later. Behind Chris Adams in white, the crowd goes mad because Chris Louis, with just 10 metres to go, but every effort of strength every effort of speed and what a tremendous performance to say in the event by Chris Louie there behind the race winner Lee Adams he's blowing kisses he's waving what a tremendous performance it's all happening here it's a tremendous Grand Prix but in our studio one of the greatest speedway riders ever is with Jonathan Green Hans Nielsen's there great Hans Nielsen is enjoying this I'm sure uh, how did you enjoy that last heat well obviously every time you go one further you enjoy it and uh, that was good what about what you've been up to? We were watching and it looked like you uh, rolled off almost to, to try and get yourself onto that third um, gate for your heat coming up. Well, I'm getting old. I have to sort of save my strength, you know, <laughs> so I thought, you know, second would be good enough for me. I wonder why it was Sam that spotted it. Well, I, I think uh, I think I seen it straight away because he kept running down the back straight away, but it, he did it very convincingly as if he did have an engine failure. But, uh... Oh, you mean he's getting old too? <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right, okay. We're going there to the top, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> But, uh, no, it's really good tactics, Hans. I hope it pays off. I mean, that last race, Lee made a start off three. We both were watching it. I told you from uh, my league racing experience, it seems gate three will probably be better later on. I think I've been talking to you before that race, wouldn't you? Yeah. The way you talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, they, I think the starts are very even. Okay, four is probably not so good, but guys have been making it from gate one, two, or three, so yeah. there's not a lot in it. Before, there was a lot of dirt on the outside, and you had a good run into the turn. 
now they're going anywhere, inside, outside, wherever. So I, I really don't know where there's no. I was going to say when you're watching this, I mean, it does, it is confusing because this track seems to have changed a lot in terms of where, where the lines are or the best lines are. From what you're watching now, have you sort of changed your mind about how you're going to approach it? Yeah, possibly, possibly. There's still a couple of races before I'm out, so I might approach it slightly uh, different. But uh, I'm obviously stuck in gate three. I can't do anything about that now. All right, we look forward to seeing you in action. Let's go back to our commentary team now. Thanks, Andy. Well, I can tell you as they approach the start, there are more machine problems for Billy Hamill, and they've worked this out, the Americans now, because they get the spare bike down there because now they're on shorter time than they ever were before, and they don't want to get caught with their pants down. And uh, Billy Hamill now comes up on the outside gate in yellow and black. His spare bike has now been moved away. He had it there waiting just in case something went wrong. That you call professionalism. Some people might call it, Peter, distortion of the rules. Well, I think those mechanics, uh, they must have lost a lot of weight running back and forwards up this start and finish straight all evening with those bikes, Tony. There's the lineup. Andy Smith on the inside from Britain. Michael Carlson, it is from Sweden, goes from gate two. The brilliant Thomas Gollop from gate three, former world champion Billy Hamill on his home league track, goes from the outside, the riders look across, up go the tapes, Gollop gets supply, which he missed out last time, holds it tight on the inside, Hamill will try to pick up pace from the back, but he's got a lot to do, it's Gollop in the white helmet colours in front now, Michael Carlson in second place, Andy Smith has got to produce a real Houdini act to stay in this Grand Prix, he's back in third place, but out front, Thomas Gollop, where he missed the gate last time, certainly made amends this time and when he gets in this position he really doesn't need to look back yeah this is the thomas golov that we know he's flying he's looking very very quick in this race it was a mistake he made in that earlier heat when he finished last but now he's learned the track but the rider in blue michael carlson's having a big go around the outside a lap and a half to go for Carlson to catch Golub. I wonder if Golub will look at tactics for his gate position next time out, like Hans Nielsen, but Carlson is going around the outside now. Golub is hunting at the inside. Battling at the back is Billy Hamill, who's through into third ahead of Andy Smith, but he's not going to make ground on the front two, but Carlson has gone by Golub. Golub is going to have second place, which means they go for the outside two gates next time out. In blue, Michael Carlson wins it. Golub in white is second. Third in yellow is Billy Hamill, who goes out disappointingly on his home league track from the Grand Prix, as does with him Andy Smith, who's won the title, the British title, here three times on this track. So with Smith and Hamill going out, Michael Carlson and Thomas Gollard marching on. It's really livening up here. There's the finishing order for heat number 16. And certainly, Peter, from that point of view, all sorts of things happened there. And what about, I wonder if Golob's was a tactical? Well, Golob's the current leader, isn't he, in the World Championship? And he makes a start. Look at that. He's got a full bike length cleared. He gets to the corner. Michael Carlson tucks in there behind him, round the first turn. Now, Golob looks in a commanding position right now. But what he actually did was he got a good lead and then he let that slip. And uh, we can see the Jawa engine there pulling out of that bend. As he goes down the back straight, he does all the work on his own engines, all the tuning's done by himself. I personally don't know how, how he finds time to do that, but we can see he wasn't riding wide enough and he allowed Michael Carlson that massive gap around the outside in all that dirt where the grip is to sneak by and uh, really threw that race away. And uh, to be honest, if he's going to be in the run, he's got to start riding out wide where we know that he does like it. But Andy Smith there and Billy Hamill cruising round at the back, and they're also on the way home. Well, it means that Billy Hamill has just six Grand Prix points and really he's having a disappointing season. It is his best performance in a Grand Prix this campaign. Remember, he had that big crash at the end of last season and previously two, three and three points he's got out of the events, but six points his best performance so far. And uh, now, well, he's got to go home and ponder upon the next one. We see uh, here now the riders coming out for heat number 17 and the first two riders in this go through to the semi-finals and there is Mark Laram on the inside. And for Mark Laram, well, we know that this is going to be a mighty important heat for him and I just wonder how well he can do. It's going to be tough for all of them here now as it's getting tight, Peter. Yeah, we've got uh, Joe Screen also and Mark Laram in this race and we've been shouting for both of those because they've both really had good rides tonight they're both looking very very good and uh, you know we're trying to be patriotic here and the English boys will be shouting for them but because we've got Jason Crump in there and Greg Hancock who's been looking very quick well, on the inside is Mark Laram, not perhaps the gate he might favour with his style of riding on this track. Greg Hancock going wide in gate two. Of course, his home league track, he knows it like the back of his hand. Jason Crump, who run the British Grand Prix here last year, goes from the outside 
And Joe Screen, of course, uh, one of the best all-round riders in British motorcycle sport. He goes from the outside in yellow. That's the lineup. Remember, the first two riders go through to the semi-finals. The next two, well, they have another chance. Mark Moran is left at the gate here. We'll have to do it. Cutting the corner short is Greg Hancock. Going round the outside is Jason Crump to pick up speed. The battle is joined because Laram is tied in second place. And this is going to be desperate stuff for the man at the back, Joe Screen, who has an awful lot to do. But look at Jason Crump because he's putting pressure on round the outside as Hancock goes wide. Crump picks up the speed again. Laram comes through into third place and will now have to battle. Yeah, the two racers are at the back screen and Laram, they're both struggling, but they're right in touch with uh, Jason Crump. Jason's having to ride all over the track to maintain that lead, but Greg Hancock's out in front in the blue and looking strong. Laram, though, is putting pressure on the man in white, Jason Crump. Hancock now seems to have got his act together. Hancock is going to look very difficult to beat here. But into second place goes Crump. The Ram looks done for in this one. He'll have another chance to make it through to the semis, but he'd have to have another race before he does so. The Ram in third place here now. Tailed off at the back now. Disappointment for Joe Screen. Time for Hancock to look back as he wins it in blue. Ahead of Jason Crump in white. Coming through in third place in red there is Mark the Ram. Tailed off at the rear is Joe Screen. The Ram and Screen will have to go again. Greg Hancock has a word with Jason Crump. They finished in that order. Hancock and Crump march on to the semi-finals from Heat 17. Well, the action doesn't stop, and we've seen some tremendous racing so far all the way for four laps here. This is the start. There's Greg Hancock. Now, this is more like the Greg Hancock we know. He's made a perfect start. His hand there is just flicking that clutch, just feathering that clutch as he gets to the first turn. So focused on the way the grip is round the inside, he turns very early, pins Mark Laram on the inside. That's Mark behind him in the red. Uh, Greg lifts his foot there over the kerb as he enters the back straight. Now Jason Crump's come into the picture very, very wide down that back straight, but he knows he's got two tigers on his tail because Joe Screen and Mark Laram are right in there putting pressure on. Very, very close at this stage. Now it looks as though Jason Crump has gone into the lead round the outside, but still on the inside. Greg Hancock is picking up all that grip from the inside, stops Jason Crump's run down the top straight there. When they get back to the pit turn, again, totally controlling the race there was Greg Hancock, and I'm sure he's very, very glad that he's just won that one. Well, Heat 17, of course, one that sees two riders going straight through to the semi-finals. Heat 18 is one that does the same, with the riders now coming out for this number, eight, heat number 18. The man in yellow and black there is Ron Sullivan, who took a bit of a buffeting first time out. In the white helmet colours is Hans Nielsen, of whom Jonathan spoke a few moments ago. The rider in blue is Tony Rickardson, lifting there the world champion. He will be going from gate two in this one. The man on the inside is Jimmy Nielsen, who has only had one race so far, as has Rickardson, and certainly doing well in both of those. Jimmy Nielsen winning heat 12, Tony Rickardson winning heat 14, Hans Nielsen well, probably should have won heat 11 but wanted apparently to get gate number 3 and that's exactly what he's got Ron Sullivan will go from the outside there is Hans Nielsen making space making the ideal start for him yeah that's Hans doing some gardening there we know Hans always likes to spend a bit of time doing this it's important that you get a nice rut or the, the actual perfect position that you need the ideal spot because it's so critical to get out of that start the back tire has got to get all the grip to that first corner and uh, Hans is the master at it we can see he was even off the bike there kicking away at the bit of circuit that he wants and uh, that's the bit where all the grip is for him well there we see gate number two the best one so far and that's where Tony Rickardson's going from the outside gate perhaps not going as well as we might have thought 15 seconds to go now to get the riders into place there is the new sign they have here in the Grand Prix because riders were concerned that they were not getting enough warning that the referee might exclude them and uh, Danny Rickardson struggling to get up the tapes here now but they are all in line this heat 17 a heat 18 the first two go through to the semis away they go in line and picking it up Rickardson well held back at the tapes is Jimmy Nielsen Nielsen on the inside going right on the outside is Hans Nielsen picking up the grip and being bolted a little bit by Nielsen in second place Ron Sullivan is at the back. Hans Nielsen, I don't think he's going quite where he wanted to, but he's picked it up now, and he's put the pressure on Nielsen round the outside. Hans Nielsen might have seen something here. Now he comes through, and he goes through the two like a meat in the sandwich into second place. A truly brilliant ride in second place by Hans Nielsen. Well, it is a good ride because we know Hans, you know, he's getting on a bit in age, and 
You've got to be brave to go for those manoeuvres, and he actually did that perfectly there. Now Ryan Sullivan's coming in the picture. Now Jimmy Nielsen's back there in third place, but Tony Rickardson's looking very good out front. Rickardson is, but a lovely manoeuvre by Hans Nielsen. Blocked the effort of Ryan Sullivan to come up the inside. And as they go into the last lap, the pressure is now being put by Jimmy Nielsen in red on Hans Nielsen. It moves away down that back straight. And now at the back coming through is Ron Sullivan. But Hans Nielsen's going to hold this. The other two will have another go. But Hans Nielsen is through to the semi-finals behind Tony Rickardson. And what a battle. In third place came Jimmy Nielsen. At the back was Ron Sullivan in yellow and black. But we now know that two former world champions are certainly through to the semi-finals. And from their point of view, well, glory is about to beckon. And the action, as I said, continues to hot up here at the Brandon Stadium Coventry. Tony Rickardson ahead of Hans Nielsen automatically through to the semi-finals. And, well, we've had 18 heats. There are six more to go of fantastic action here at the British Grand Prix. Those follow after the break. Welcome Good back run. to Coventry. The lights are on. We've got the cameras. And so far, we've had some superb action from round four of the British Grand Prix. Speedway at its finest. Some of the world's best, including with me, the 1993 world champion. Of course, the 1997 world champion, Greg Hancock, through to the semifinals. And you're riding him outstandingly at the moment. Are you happy with the way things are going? Yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. I, I feel like I've got a, uh, a good combination working right now. We've, we've had a couple of uh, a testing sessions here trying to get it right. And, I really feel confident. I'm making good starts, so uh, that's the key to success. Me and Sam have been talking. It seems like a lot of riders are struggling with the line out there. How are you finding it? Well, I, I think it's uh, it's kind of uh, deceiving, too, because it's still a little bit dark out there, and it looks like there's some good racing lines, but it's a little bit too far to go now, unless you've got a really good setup going well. And uh, as you saw, Michael Carlson made a good pass there, and Jason Crump was giving me quite a run in the last one. What do you think? I mean, I watched you a couple times, and... Uh sharpness at the start is the key here and you made a couple of blistering starts and it was just from the word go it was like bulleting out into the corner i mean what's the gate positioning like now and how important is that in the semifinals you guys flip for it so is it a bit of a lottery now or it's a little bit of a lottery but um i know that i've got either gate one or two now coming into the semifinal and i feel that uh two is probably more advantageous to myself i've i made a good one last time out and like you say i'm trying to find something that's got a little bit of tackiness there to get that direct positive start and i've had it sort of probably three out of four starts and i feel good but i'm not sure about gate one it's not a disadvantage but i think two would be more my favorite I know. Briefly, Greg, how big is this night to you? We've talked about what happened to Billy Hammond, and obviously your buddy's really disappointed, but what about you tonight? Uh, this is uh, this is make or break for me, you know. I mean, I'm still chasing roster and position, and anything can happen in the world of Speedway. So on my home track, I know people are expecting a lot. I'm expecting a lot. I'm going for it. All right, let's go back to our commentary team at Peter Collins and Tony Mellon. Thanks, Greg. Well, as we look now at Heat 19, the first two go to the semi-finals. The second two are eliminated. So this is a vital time. It's glory or bust in this one. And really the competition, because Mark Laram in the white helmet colours, the man in red there is Lee Adams, but the battle I'm looking forward to is Thomas Golob in gate two, in blue there. And in the background is uh, Mark Laram. And uh, there will be no prisoners taken, I'm sure, in this one. Ron Sullivan goes from the outside in uh, yellow and black. Yeah, the track's drying out a little bit, Tony. It's it's quite... Um, there's not such a lot of grip around the mid-track to the inside. As uh, Greg Hancock was saying, there is a lot of dirt out wide, and we do know that Mark Laram and Thomas Golub do like to ride out wide. Uh, but Lee Adams is very fast from the start. Well, we've got a problem here because Ron Sullivan hasn't made it. The two-minute warning is on. There's a lot of frenetic action away to our right that you can't see in the pits as we're waiting for Ron Sullivan to come and complete the quartet here. And there we see him coming out. The Australian is going to have to rush a little bit if he's going to make the start here. And I'm sure that our referee, Mr Istvan from Hungary, will have to be a little bit patient. But uh, there is Ron Sullivan on his way and uh, moving away because uh, visors tend to uh, steam up in this weather and uh, certainly... Ron Sullivan getting down the track now. The other riders not too happy at being kept waiting. There's the lineup. Lee Adams, the Australian, goes from the inside. Thomas Golob, the flying pole from gate two. Mark Naram goes from gate three. And on the outside is Ron Sullivan in yellow and black. That's the lineup. This is heat number 19. This is going to be vital. Remember, it's glory if you finish the first two. It's disappointment. You're eliminated. 
Charles to Starling Marshall moves away, away they go and on the inside it's a great start by Lee Adams Thomas Gollop holds him tight, coming around the outside and picking it up, Mark Laram. Gollop goes through now, Laram goes through behind him, Laram's chasing Gollop now in second place with Adams relegated to third, the Brit is battling here, Lee Adams is, oh he's bolt Mark Laram, Laram's going to have to go the other way round as Adams comes wide, Laram now comes up the inside, oh there's a battle in second place but pole position is being held by Thomas Gollop out front but Mark Laram there in the white helmet colours is not going to give up trying. Yeah if Mark can get a good run around the outside we know he can do it but that time he went too wide he's been pushed off the racing line Ryan Sullivan's now sniffing rare for that third place well there's a lap and a quarter to go Mark Laram is not done he's now trying the inside inside Lee Adams but he's got work to do here out front is Thomas Gollard last ditch attempt by Mark Laram to pick it up in second place is Adams there goes Laram down the back straight can he spring a last minute one on Lee Adams here he will come back up the inside on this one he will try he will do it oh the referee's got to make the decision that was really close on the line I wouldn't want to be in the referee's shoes I wonder if we can see a photo finish in that because Thomas Gollop undoubtedly won it but the battle between Mark Laram in the white helmet colours and Lee Adams well they've given it to Lee Adams on the final captions there but I think we must see the replay of this because I'm sure that Mark Laram will think he almost got there and it was desperately tied how the referee can give it that quickly on the line well I really don't know the replay from the start well the battle was joined but the finish is where the action really is Tony, what a fantastic race, but you really got to feel for Mark Laram. As far as trying was concerned there, he gave 200%. You can see there, he was right in the thick of things all the time. Thomas Golob didn't look particularly quick. He held the race up a little bit. You can see Thomas there, the way he just sneaked past the outside of Lee Adams. Now, Thomas doesn't seem to pull away. There's all kinds of action going on behind him. Now, that's Mark Laram there trying the big blast around the outside, down the bottom end. Mark again's on the outside, Lee Adams is on the inside, but well, you can see Thomas, Thomas in the blue helmet, he's not pulling away, you can see Lee Adams is there, it looks as though Lee Adams is going to go by Thomas Golob, as they cross the line there, Mark gets pinned onto the inside, which is a bad place for him, and uh, but what an effort from Mark, full marks for trying. Well, he tried all the way, but I'm sure we're going to have a chance to see the freeze frame. It was near, so near and yet so far for the Brit, who's battled all night. He's had some things to contend with here, but uh, Lee Adams certainly in second place. And uh, really, from this point of view, as we're moving on to the next heat, I wonder if we can have a look at the freeze frame. There is the freeze frame. Referee absolutely right. It was a matter of some 15 inches on the line, but Kelvin Tatum is among the action in the pits. Okay, thanks, Tony, very much. Um, uh, joining me now is Tony Rickards. And Tony, you've really been looking like a world champion tonight. Yeah, it's been going great, you know, it's uh, hopefully I can have a travel-free GP. I've been feeling great all year and I think I've been at, at least as good as I was last year, you know, it's just things hasn't been going my way in the GPs, but I hope I can have a travel-free tonight and hopefully pull off a win. I think that, um, uh, you know, like you've won two races really convincingly. Uh, yeah, OK, sorry, we've got a break there and uh, well done. We'll hopefully we'll talk to you later on. Back to uh, the commentary crew. Kelvin Tatum rushing in the pits just like he has to on the racetrack. Twice times world long track champion. But here the riders on the in the action for heat number 20 where again the first two go through to the semi-finals and the last two are eliminated. The rider in white there is Jimmy Nielsen, the current rider line second in the World Championship Grand Prix behind Thomas Golob. Chris Louie, who provided some really frenetic action for us, goes in blue. He's from gate two. On the inside in red is Michael Carlson. Jimmy Nielsen goes from gate three and Joe Screen, a British hope, on the outside. So two Brits in this against Carlson and Nielsen. It's going to be mighty tough for Chris Lewis and Joe Screen, Peter. Yeah, just notice Jimmy Nielsen, he's gone very, very close to the start, Marshall. He's very near to him and he's possibly too close for that. The referee may not allow that, but he seems to be letting the tapes go. He's let it go, but picking it up in blue is Chris Louis, and Louis is the man in charge here, and if he can do it, he will get through to the semi-finals. Remember, only two British riders have ever made a main final. Chris Louis is one of them. Can he do it again tonight? But at the back, packing up, is Michael Carlson up against the fence. So, one has gone. Can one more go to allow the Brits to do it? Because Joe Screen is steaming round the outside. He's got to catch Jimmy Nielsen, who's in white, and he's trying desperately. But Chris Louis in control in the front. The battle in second place intense now as Joe Screen goes through. And Peter Collins alongside me goes wild. Joe Screen could say, get to the semis. Joe
still use that little bit of grip down the bottom end there. Jimmy's struggling a bit in third place. There's Michael Carlson, the Conrad's come through the engine. There's Jimmy Nielsen having to go at Joe Screen. We've seen during the year a bit of friction between these two, but Jimmy looks as though he's not in the position now to get back at Joe. Joe's riding his heart out in this one. The man who'll be delighted with this is Thomas Gollop because Jimmy Nielsen won't get into the semi-finals if it stays like this, and Thomas Gollop will march on, but Jimmy Nielsen is out and the Brits are through, two Brits are through to the semi-finals because Chris Louis in blue ahead of Joe Screen in yellow and black finished ahead there of the disappointed and disappointing Jimmy Nielsen who will lose ground on Thomas Gollub at the top. What a tremendous effort by the two Brits. The chequered flag goes to Chris Louis there ahead of Joe Screen. Jimmy Nielsen tumbles out, but the two Brits go through to the semi-finals. It was a four-lap battle of tremendous speedway, and the Union Jacks came out on top. Well, that's what we want to see. What a brilliant ride there for the two Brits. Look at Chris Louis in the blue helmet. He makes a beautiful start there, right in the thick of things. Nobody really expected that because Jimmy Nielsen is such a good gator. Jimmy was off gate three. He didn't make it. He's in the thick of the action behind him. But Michael Carlson slots into second place here behind Chris Louis. But Chris has got his sort of tail up. He's going down there now. He's got so much speed. And uh, Jimmy Nielsen now is going round the outside. But there, entering the bottom bend, Michael Carlson. Some serious uh, problems there with the bike. It was either a chain breaking. Uh, there's all sorts of sparks coming off that rear chain or something very serious has gone in the engine but this is where uh, Jimmy Nielsen on the outside of him just avoids that accident there with the engine from Michael Carlson. Well disappointment there for Michael Carlson but glory for the Brits in the white helmet colour there Jimmy Nielsen overtaken by the rider in yellow and black Joe Screen from then on it was Britain one and two with Chris Louie in blue and his teammate or international teammate Joe Screen in yellow and black. Two Brits go through to the semi-finals. The action is thick and fast, but in our studio, Jonathan Green and Sam Malenko know all about it. Yeah, Tony, I agree with you totally there. A massively significant heat, especially with Jimmy Nielsen not doing what he needs to do because we I was just saying earlier how cool, calm and collected he was. I thought he'd go head to head with Gollop, but the two Brits have come through. Yeah, definitely. I mean we got a feel from Michael Carlson. Looking at the the video shot there it looked like maybe he broke a subframe or something and he lost his chain and everything came apart on him. But it did open the doors for um, Joe to get in there and have a sneak sneak on Jimmy. Jimmy probably thought he was comfortable after that and Jimmy's an inside line rider and Joe knows that. So Joe just I think was determined to keep going around him. And maybe caught him off guard, maybe not. I don't know. I think Jimmy tried to get back in, and Joe just stuck to his line. Well, I loved it because, you know, uh, Joe Screen, he really did shock him. It was a really quick move. He came right up there, and we only had to go back to our Elite League coverage. You were right in the thick yep. of it. These guys have come together on a couple of occasions. They're not the best of friends. No, the best that's of times, right. I mean, there, there's a lot going out there. I mean, right now it's real important on who gets into that uh, the semifinals for the finals. And Jimmy has everything to go for. And whether he was taking it easy or not, I don't know. But uh, Joe definitely was hungry, and I don't think he had any hard feelings uh, taking the line. What about the style of Joe Scream? Because um, quite quite impressive tonight. Well, I mean, this track probably isn't going to suit him later on. I mean, it's, there's a bit there for him right now, but he's chasing the outside lines, and it's it's really difficult uh, if there's not enough grip there, and if you get stuck out there and somebody sneaks underneath you. I mean, right now, we got to look at probably, you know, Thomas Golov. I mean, I'm surprised how quick he got his bike going on this kind of track. Uh, he's done well. They're watering the track a little bit, so maybe there'll be a little bit of dirt. Golov's the kind of rider like that, so screen, so... Maybe there's not going to be enough room for him out there. We haven't mentioned too much about Chris Louis, the unassuming great champion of Britain. He's through. He's gone quietly through. And it's been somewhat of a big meeting for him. But he's right where he needs to be. And, of course, he's down in the pits with Calvin Tatum. Oh, thanks, Jonathan. I'm joined, as, as you say, with Chris. Chris, uh, that was a superb last ride. You win, won that. Uh, have you made any changes? Because earlier on, it looked like you were struggling a little bit. Yeah, early on, I was riding a bike that I had faith in. And uh, you know how it is. You want to keep riding it, keep making changes. In the end, I decided I was struggling too much, so we changed bikes, and uh, I was glad to go off something other than gate four in that one, and actually made a start, and uh, it was a bit easier, so I'm happy with this bike. Yeah, well, that's, that's super, and obviously you, your, your Grand Prix uh, this, year, this year hasn't been so good, your performance hasn't been so good, so you, you must be delighted that you're doing well at home in your home Grand Prix. Yeah, I've never had a good uh, English Grand Prix, I've always had mechanical problems, and one thing or another going wrong, so uh, fingers crossed, we're getting set up a little bit better and better as we're going through tonight, and... Uh, semi-final let's hopefully i can make that final sure that's looking good well um uh, good luck for the rest of the evening and uh, back to uh, go back to the studio now
Thanks, Kelvin. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Chris Louie, he is a quiet man, but I tell you what, inside his heart right now is burning a need because we mentioned at the top of the programme, he may not be up there trying to, you know, win the whole championship, but he wants to be desperately in the Grand Prix next year. And, you know, there's a, if he wasn't going to do well here, there was a possibility he could be dropping well, down. Well, I mean, everything's on the line right now. Those guys on the bottom, I mean, Chris isn't in the top of the standings. Like he's not in the top eight, so everything's important. There's a, no, a couple other guys in the same position, you know, so... To do it on his, in front of his home crowd, he's got to be pretty pleased about it. I mean, to be able to have the courage to change a bike, get off a bad horse or a good horse, you know, I mean, what do you do? So he made the right decision, and it worked out for him. A lot of good men have gone down today already. Let's take a look at who's been eliminated already, Sam. Andy Smith, a great valiant effort by him. He started so well. The big one, obviously, Billy Hamill. He, at 21st in the championship, desperately needed to turn it round. It wasn't to be. Michael Carlson out, and also Ryan Sullivan. Yeah, I mean, Stefan Dano had a chance of possibly squeezing in up there in the top in the in maybe getting a Rossum position, so it kind of was really, really bad for him. In the end, though, the most significant in terms of the championship, Jimmy Nielsen, and a real shame for Mark Laram. Everybody wanted him to do well. He's been on such a high. He's already won a Grand Prix, but, you know, Jimmy Nielsen. I, be I bet you Jimmy right now is in the pits hoping that Golov makes a big mistake in the next one to keep a fighting chance because if Golov makes this final now, um, pretty much I think the, 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 gods, the gods are on him because he's at his home track now in, uh, in Poland next, and, uh, man, it's going to be hard to beat the guy. Well, through to the semifinals already, Greg Hancock, Hans Nielsen, the old man has come through for Denmark. I was talking to the Danish TV guys, and they were saying that he was past it. Well, you can look at that semifinal lineup and know that he's not. Thomas Golub, well, yes, 23 riders, I think, want to make sure that he doesn't get any far, but Thomas Golub is riding superbly. Joe Screen's through, Rickardson through, as is Jason Crump, two-time winner of the British Grand Prix, Chris Louis of Britain, and Lee Adams. Let's get down to our commentary team for the next team. Heat number 21 brings together some Greg of the aces in World Speedway. There is Thomas Golob, who will be going from gate three in white. He is a big threat. The man in yellow and black on the outside is Joe Screen, who produced the goods on the final lap of his semi-final. Hans Nielsen, the professor, the master of Speedway, goes from gate one. Former world champion Greg Hancock on his home league track here at Coventry goes from gate two. This is quite a lineup. Do you think, PC, that Golob in gate three is where he'd like to be? I think that's a pro possibly a good place for him to be, but I don't think he's quick tonight. He doesn't look very fast. In that last race, uh, there were cracks there in as far as he was holding the race up. He won it, but he didn't look quick enough. Well, there's no second chance in this one because the first two go to the final. The next two have the consolation final. Golob is held back. Nielsen picks it up on the inside. Golob's back in third. Coming through in blue is Greg Hancock to pick it up. Golob is now last. They'll want to hold him there. There'll be 73 riders in the pits hoping Golob can stay out. Out there in front now is Greg Hancock in blue. Second place is Hans Nielsen. Golub has got a lot to do in third place because coming round the outside of him is Joe Screen. But this is something of a shock, PC. Yeah, Golub struggling there in third place. He's having a real thing done with Joe Screen. Uh, he's got past Joe Screen, but I think Joe's got him back now. Hans Nielsen is their target because they know they've got to get past Hans to get into the final. But of course, here we go. Joe Screen is having to go. Hans Nielsen's got a bit of a lead. Golob locked up and been coming out of that bend. Golob has a lot to do to make the final tonight as they go into lap three. In front is Greg Hancock, a former world champion. In second place is Hans Nielsen, three times a former world champion. In third place is Joe Screen and Thomas Golob is going to go out. Thomas Golob is retiring at the top end, but a great ride by the rider in blue, Greg Hancock, ahead of Hans Nielsen. Both of those go through to the final. Two former world champions. Joe Screen in yellow is in third place. Thomas Golob has packed up. He's getting booed by the crowd. I'm not quite sure about that. Something seriously wrong, he claims mechanically, but I think he'd be desperately disappointed because Thomas Golob finishing there will only get into the consolation final, and that means there is a chance for people to pick up points on him. And really, the riders making that final tonight. Hans Nielsen and Greg Hancock. Greg Hancock's currently eighth in the standings. Hans Nielsen down at 16th, and the gaps will start to close. Yeah, we forgot all about Greg Hancock there. You can see Greg right in the middle of the pack there. He missed the start. Hans Nielsen's leading coming out of the first turn. But like I suspected, uh, Thomas Golob just was not quick enough because he didn't make that start. And there he is walking back to the pits. Very disappointed. Not going to be in that A final. Can that Grand Prix lead be slipping away from him? It definitely will. And is that world title still in his grasp?
Well, Greg Han got the winner through to the final. Hans Nielsen, former world champion, through to the final. Joe Screen, assured of a place in the top eight, which means the main event next time out. Thomas Golov will be in the main event next time out, but dejected there now, the highest paid sportsman in Poland, because he will be desperately disappointed. He has made two of the three A finals so far this season and has won two of them. Kelvin Tatum in the pits is with another disappointed man, Jimmy Nielsen. Thanks, Tony. Jim, joining me now, Jimmy, you, your emotions must be going up and down like a yo-yo. You know, one minute you got knocked out, and then your main rival looks like he's happy, and then the next minute he's knocked out. You know, um, uh, you must be relieved. Yeah, it's a strange old feeling tonight. You know, people were going all over the place, and uh, I couldn't get a right set up tonight. I tried everything, and uh, just couldn't get work tonight. The bike wasn't working for me, and uh, I'm out. Yeah, but, you know, like, I know I spoke to you in the middle of the week, and you seemed really happy. You seemed to be very confident. Why, why, why do you think your bikes weren't working well tonight? I don't know. I couldn't get it right. You know, I felt in a practice I wasn't happy after it. And uh, yeah. I don't know. You get them days, you know, and uh, how do you make it? Okay. Well, thanks very much, Jimmy. Thanks for talking to us. Back to uh, Tony and Peter in the commentary box. Well, I wonder what next is going to happen among the surprises, the controversial incidents and the entertainment here for this big crowd in the Brandon Stadium. They've thoroughly enjoyed it, a tremendous Speedway meeting here tonight. There in the yellow helmet colours is Lee Adams, the Australian. He's been consistent throughout tonight and certainly will be battling. On the inside is Tony Ricardson. Chris Louie goes from the outside in yellow and black. Lee Adams is in white going from gate number three. Chris Louie goes in yellow and black from the outside. And that, I just wonder whether it'll suit him or not. Tony Ricardson and Jason Crump inside them. Yeah, Tony's the man on farm, and uh, there he is on the inside start position. Not favourable, but the way he's riding tonight, he's flying, and uh, if anyone's going to make it from down there on the inside, it's Tony, and I've very been very impressed with him tonight. Absolutely flying. Away they go then, this is heat number 22, the semi-final on the inside in red, Tony Ricards of the world champion, moving through in blue is Jason Crump, winner of this British Grand Prix last season, Chris Louis is back in third, Lee Adams tail off at the back, Louis the British hope will have to go well, I just wonder if we can get another Brit in the final, that would be absolutely marvellous, but Chris Louis is now going to have to work, Tony Ricards are out front, Louis is through into second place, ahead of Jason Crump, and now one of those two is not going to make the final, but out front Tony Ricardson certainly is. Yeah, Chris Lewis said he'd been doing some adjustments on his bike all evening. He seems to have been going better and better as the evening's progressed. Now he's got plenty of speed. He had enough speed there to overtake Jason Crump. And now he seems to be catching Tony Ricardson. So the way, uh, the way he's going, I'm very, very pleased about him. And another Brit flying the flag for us. Well, Chris Lewis, if it stays like this, will make the final. The fancy Jason Crump won't. And out front, certainly Tony Ricardson will, and the current world champion, third in the series so far, will be delighted with this as he takes the jacket flag in red. Joy two for Chris Louis in second place in yellow. In third place, Jason Crump in blue will have to be content with a place in the consolation final. But look at the British fans. There is Chris Louis saluting them. Tony Ricardson in the background. Absolutely brilliant. Well, there's plenty more to come because the places will sort themselves out. We know now who's in the final because the first two in that one will be joining Greg Hancock and Hans Nielsen. And the action has not finished yet. There's more to come from the Brandon Stadium here at Coventry in this exciting British Grand Prix. It gets better and better as we go down to Brands Hatch for round nine of the World Superbikes. Carl Fogarty and the boys will be in action. It all starts at 11 a.m. I'm whisking myself down there as quickly as I can, but not until this is complete. The British Grand Prix of Speedway here in Coventry, and it's really looking to get uh, to a heck of a final. Sam Omalenko, we're really enjoying it. We've got the best seat in the house. We've said it already. We've also had seen some great rides, and in terms of the permutations for the championship, it's a lot of significance here. Well, I've been trying to work all the maths out here. I mean, that's another part we got to do. But, um, I mean, Golob, I mean, he's 65 points right now, and Jimmy not having any chance of making any points by getting in the Constellation or the final. Things are up now. I think Tony Rickardson's probably in the driving seat of this one. If he can go out there and win that one, and Golob finishing low in the, in the, in the Constellation race, the, the, the championship's wide open. Well, one man is doing great well, of course, is Joe Screen of Britain. He's with Kelvin Tatum in the pits. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, a consolation final for you tonight, Joe. Are, are you happy with that? Yeah, really. Um, you know, I've had gate fourth, I think, three times, and gate fourth is not a good good one for me tonight. Um, you know, I battled hard from behind. We, we made a few changes for the last two heats, and my bike was working better. So, 
you know, we, we made a mistake with the gear and we started on. And um, but you know, I'm happy enough uh, in the consolation. You know, I want to get an A final, desperate. And uh, but you got to be, you got to be pleased with this. Yeah, well, you, you've been certainly been entertaining us. You know, you've been diving inside and outside. Um, uh, you know, you've got gate three in the consolation final. Do you think that's going to work well for you? Well, it can't be worse than four. You know, I'm sort of, um, sort of not making a good jump, and I was waiting for the riders to go in the corner before I made a move. And you know, I had a good race with Jimmy there. You know, me and Jimmy hasn't met since that uh, controversy, and uh, it was a good. You know, I, you know, I'm glad I got the uh, better of him. But you know, now I've got a better, better start now, so I'm hoping. Um, to make a good one, I think I don't. I think Thomas is on one. I think uh, he'll knock us on the dog track before the first, uh, before anyway. the second bend. Yeah. Anyway, thanks very much, Joe. I'm uh, best of luck in the consolation final. Back to you, um, uh, Jonathan, I believe, and uh, Sam in the studio. That's right, Kelvin. It's us, and uh, God, old Joe Screen's got that big old British flag on his. So hopefully, he'll be waving that to the crowd yeah. afterwards. I don't care whether he's aware of it, waving it or not, because we really want him to do well. Yeah, no, he's feeling pretty proud. I was just looking at, you know, Joe's in eighth position at the moment. Well, actually, I should say that. Joe's got to climb the ladder. He's seventh position overall in the Grand Prix right now. Greg Hancock is eighth, so Greg being in the final is going to pull him up. But both Chris Louie and Hans Nielsen that are both in the final are in 15th and 16th spots, so they need that final to keep in that top eight. Yeah, the beginning of this meeting, not so much Hans Nielsen because he's dropped out of the limelight, but certainly Chris Louie in this country desperately wanted to do well here, not only because he hasn't done well at British Grand Prix, but because of what we mentioned earlier, the fact that these guys are all trying desperately to get into the Grand Prix next year. It's pretty important. It's only going to get tougher. The FIM does change the rules around a little bit, but I think this year they got it right for the for the challenge and stuff, and it's going to be a tough one for everybody. So it's important to stay in that top eight if you got the chance. Well, as you can see, Thomas Gollop getting ready for his consolation prize, really. But... Um, it's actually not a consolation prize. It's actually real important. Well, 15 points. Yeah, 15 it could be. points. I mean, he needs every point he can. You know, he can't, he can't sit back and wait for it. And, uh, you know, all the other guys know that they, you know, they're probably all hoping that he doesn't really do very well that's going to open up the, the championship. But he's riding really well this year, and I wish him all the luck. Well, the bikes are headed out, and it is a significant heat for yeah. Thomas Golub. He needs these points. He needs all 15. If he wants to keep ahead in the championship. He will remain ahead after tonight. But Rickardson is hot. Let's go to our commentary team once again. The mathematics as we look at Lee Adams in red there is if he gets 15 points here, Thomas Gollum will go to 80 Grand Prix points. If Tony Ricardson were to win the final, he would go to 66 points and that would put 14 points in it. That's about as close as it can get. Already on 64 is Jimmy Nielsen. There is Thomas Gollum going from the outside. We've seen him in the league matches go from the outside. We know what he can do from that gate. He'll be diving for that bend, Peter, I'm sure. Yeah, I think Thomas will be a worried man right now. He can see some of that lead slipping away. He knows the best he can do is to win this B final. And if he's going to be world champion, possibly still won't be enough because he's got to be in there in the A, fine, A finals regularly. And to me, he just doesn't look fast enough. Well, remember the next round is at his home track in Bydgoszcz in Poland, and that will be a tremendous advantage to him before the series uh, finishes at Voyens. But uh, now we have this consolation final. They are racing for places five to se uh, five to eight in the Grand Prix series, and that means they get 15, 14, 12, and 10 points respectively in the finishing order. That's Lee Adams, the Australian, in the red helmet colours. He goes from the inside. Next to him in blue is Jason Crump, surprisingly beaten. We thought he would make the A final here, having won the British Grand Prix last year. The rider in white is Joe Screen. We heard from him just a few moments ago talking to Kelvin. On the outside, the man who got the booze of the crowd when he retired in his semi-final, uh, Thomas Gollop. But I'm sure that he'll be going for those 15 points and retaining that lead. This is the lineup. The consolation final it is. Places five to eight. Peter, it's going to be tough this one, isn't it? It is. Uh, <laughs> there's Screeny on the gate three position, and uh, he's probably a bit worried to have Thomas Golov right next to him as they enter that first turn. The riders look down at the tapes. They try to creep the man that creeps his crop, but he does get in front. Golov now is stuck in third place. Will try and come through the inside. The gate shut on him by Lee Adams. The Australians almost team riding at the back. Well, Golov has packed up again. I don't know what he's waving at the crowd. Thomas Golob is out of this one. Real disappointment for him because it means that he'll only get 10 Grand Prix points from this and it'll be even closer. This is brilliant for the rest of the Grand Prix field but not brilliant for a very unhappy Thomas Golob you see in your picture there. But 
Let's look back on the track here because Jason Crump is marching ahead of Lee Adams and he didn't like that. He's protesting to the referee. He's blocking the track. There's going to be controversy here. He's standing on the finishing line. He's moved his bike away. He's having a go at the referee. The action on the track is relatively unimportant because Thomas Golov, as they go into the last lap, we didn't even see the starting marshal putting the, 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 the flag out. I think he's almost lost count of the laps. He said he didn't see the lights. Thomas Golov is absolutely furious. I can't help thinking that was simply an excuse by him because he didn't make the start. Who knows? He kept going. He packed up. All sorts of things happening here. Thomas Golub is far from happy, but the action on the track sees Jason Crump, who's going to get the valuable 15 points here in the blue helmet colours. Second in red is Lee Adams. Taking the consolation place in white and valuable Grand Prix points is Joe Screen. But all of that has been overshadowed by the eclipse of this man, Thomas Golub. They are celebrating the Australians. But Thomas Golub is going to march. He's not allowed to do this. He's going to march onto the track, up to the referee's box. He's calling the referee down. It's a Hungarian referee. Well, the captions are up. Jason Crump, the winner ahead of Lee Adams. But that man, Jason Crump, is allowed to talk on the phone to the referee. His entourage is going with him. Graham Reeve, the liaison officer from the ACU, is with him as well. And he's going all the way back now to speak on the pitch phone to our referee. But I wonder, Peter Collins, what will come of this? Well, nothing, uh, because basically I think it's something to do with the green light. Before the tapes actually go up, uh, the green light comes on, two or three seconds, and then the tapes. I think Thomas is Hello, claiming referee. he didn't see uh, the light come on, uh, and uh, that's Thomas his fault. Thomas representative would like to speak to you, please. If you well, second, they've got his representative, all sorts okay. of things happening here. Yeah. Hello? The referee. The referee. Right, just speak to Thomas, please. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, this is Thomas' manager. Listen, there was a red light on coming on out of into, gate, into turn three. The yellow lights were flashing. The yellow light was on. And that's why he shut off. Uh, Thomas. Yes. The uh, flashing red lamp didn't work. You couldn't see any red flags. The flashing red light didn't work. Yeah, it, has, it, it, it was, was flashing for, all over the track. It was for some seconds when the flashing yellow lamp worked. Yeah, well, the yellow but, was on, that's what not, I'm saying. Not, not uh, the red light, and you couldn't see any red flags. Sorry. Not, the red light was on, it was flashing, the yellow no, light was flashing. No, no, yellow, not the red, the Ye yellow. Yeah, the yellow light was flashing. Yellow for some seconds without any flags and without voice. It wasn't stop the heat. Oh, sorry. But if you want, if you want to protest, if you want to protest, uh, could you talk to the clerk of the course, please? If you want to Esteban. protest, you can do it, Thomas. Esteban. Uh, Esteban. Uh, yeah. It's Graham Reeve. The yellow lights came on during the race. Yeah. That's why he stopped. Yeah, I, I know it, but it was the yellow light and not the red light. There wasn't any red flags. But if the rider wanted to protest, he, he could do it. Hang on, just a minute. Sorry. If the, Hello. If the right... Even Eastman? Yeah. Holly here. Yeah. East, what happened there with the, with the yellow light? Uh, I don't know exactly. It, it didn't go out? Sorry? The, did the yellow light come on? Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll rerun the race. Yeah. We'll rerun the race. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. For me, yeah. Okay, boys. Heat The situation there is that Ollie Olsen, who we see in your picture, the race director, has instructed the referee to rerun the race. Now, this is quite extraordinary because the referee must be the man who makes the adjudication. Graham Reeve was the uh, ACU official, the liaison man, but Ollie Olsen there is the race director and he has instructed the Hungarian referee to rerun the race because the yellow light came on. That yellow light was actually the uh, two minute warning light that hadn't in fact gone off, so I understand, and that now means that the referee has been instructed by the race director to run it and that is something Peter Collins certainly usurping the referee's decision of power. Yeah, that's a strange one because uh, the only reason that you uh, should stop in a race is if the red light comes on. Uh, there was no red light. If there was a yellow light flashing, 
uh, you know, you should really keep going. Hello, and Thomas Sammy? was yeah. at the back yes, at that stage. Why he didn't keep going, light, I don't know. A red light, yes, stop, but I not a yellow light. Well, that's quite extraordinary, and if you're going to have a referee at these meetings, he must have some power. I just wonder what Samo Malenko, as a former world champion himself and Grand Prix rider, thinks about this extraordinary situation, Sam. Well, if you want my true feelings, guys, I mean, I almost wouldn't put my headphones down and walk out of here because, I mean, obviously there was a mistake. I've seen it. I was the one. I was I was, I was. was on to Thomas Golob's side that the yellow lights were on. But the referee made a decision, you know. He told the other riders, look, and he told Thomas Golob, look, I'm not changing my mind. And he turns around and Ole Olsen has the power to change the meeting. That's probably the only thing I don't, I don't agree with. But, Sam, in these circumstances, who is in control of the meeting? Is it the Grand Prix race director or the referee? You tell me. I mean, I wish I, wish I knew that, you know. I mean, I'm sitting on the sidelines out of the Grand Prix. I wish I was in there. I mean, I'm biased because I want to be a part of it. But the way that just happened, I mean, geez, my heart's broken for the sport if that, could, if that can go on. And plus, we've seen it on TV, and that's, that's not really good. One of the guys who's um, – let's uh, see if we can hear what the ref's saying. But uh, obviously – Crump's right so in there. It stands the heat. We, we can't. Here's as Olsen. decision is, we leave the heat as it was. Okay? And uh, we, we go the final. Okay? It, yeah, we go the final. Okay. Uh, see, I, well, mean, they just, I mean, they just, they just changed everything there. You know? This is quite an extraordinary situation because Oli Olsen, having told the referee that the race had to be rerun, has now told the referee we leave the heat as it is. Now, Jason Crump is among the riders there, of course, who in whose interest it is for Thomas Golob not to get so many race points. So now now, rider power has taken over as well, Peter. Yeah, I mean, you've got to feel for the three riders that were out there and completed the race, never stopped, and raced for the whole four laps. Jason Crump won it, uh, Lee Adams was second, Joe Screen was third, and basically I'm pretty sure that there's no way that they want to go out in another rerun to give Thomas Golub another chance, who was in last place, who stopped for a yellow light, and I think Ollie should not have tried to overrule the referee like that because he didn't take the other three riders' views into consideration. You cannot... Uh, take the views of one man into consideration and uh, you know this is a, this is a very strange one this shouldn't really be happening Tony well uh, we've heard of authority overruling referees in other sports and this really shouldn't happen the referee had made the decision and I think we can go back to our lads in the studio for more news yeah Tony I mean there's all sorts of atmosphere here you can hear Jason Crump here sending the applause for the fact that this race is not going to be rerun but you were the most vocal you were in there you made sure that you were going to get your point across didn't you well definitely i mean it's um you know in prague in the a final i was impaired by a flare being let off on the first lap that that's never been known to the public but i was let i was saw a red flare let off by the polish supporters on the first turn yeah i shut the gas off that nothing happened there was no red light from me racing i was in the race i didn't see a red light anywhere did you see the yellow light I, no i didn't okay i, I must was have... i was racing sam you know what sure, it's like sure. when you're racing the guys have got to put a flag out in front of you before you sure, stop absolutely you know, especially in a, in a championship you just don't give up till... you're right i mean yeah. we're <laughs> sometimes it's hard different. to stop us isn't it yeah sure. i mean i was I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed with the way that was handled i mean there was there was no need for any of that to well, happen. There was no the, question the race it was a yellow light. Stopped. Yeah, there was no question it was a yellow light, but it's the fast that, that, that took place after that, and who's who's actually making the decisions? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Ollie's supposed to be the race director, and he's supposed to represent 24 riders. You know, Thomas is a great rider, but he can't expect things like this to happen in his favour all the time. Um, you know, I think I think we've got to have a serious look at some of the things that have happened, and we've got to we've got to learn from it and um, become a bit more positive from it. Well, thanks for talking to us. We've got to get back to the action. Of course, there's still a final to come. Jason Crump is at least a little bit happier now. But let's get down to the final with your commentary team once again. Peter Collins and Tony Millard. Well, it really is extraordinary, but now here are the gladiators. Here are the lads that march out to contest the final. And we know that Tony Ricardson, the world champion, has choice of gates. Greg Hancock will have second choice, and I just wonder whether we could get a surprise win. I have to say that uh, exactly what the lads were saying, Jason Crump was saying, what it has done is close the total down on Thomas Gollop to 75 points. He's now just 11 in front of Jimmy Nielsen, and really, well, if it goes the way, he will only be nine in front of Tony Ricardson if he wins this. The decision may be right or wrong, Peter, but it's good for the World Championship. Well, it is. Um, I personally uh, go along with the way the, the race stood. Uh, the race should stand. Uh, like I say, Thomas was at the back, but now we're looking at the uh, A final, and uh, Hans Nielsen suddenly come good uh, right before this final. 
Tony Rickards has been riding brilliantly all night. Chris Louie, who's been uh, improving all through the evening. And Greg Hancock, who started off a little bit shakily, has been flying. So uh, I'm really excited about this. But Tony Rickards in there, he's looking uh, for the gate position that's going to suit him in this final. And... Uh, is looking as though Blue may be the favourite at the moment. Well, Tony Rickardson there does have first choice. He is the current world champion. He's now going over to have a look at the inside gate. Quite clearly, he's going to go for one of those two. The most successful gate tonight, as the figures show, is gate two there. 48% of the races have been won from that gate. But Tony Rickardson is taking his time. Thomas Golob in the pits is licking his wounds. And I just wonder what the outcome of this is going to be. I've just got a feeling we haven't seen all the pages turned on this British Grand Prix yet. It's been a night. It's exciting, Tony, that's for sure. We're having a great night. Inside gate for Tony Rickardson. He will go in red. He took a long time to do it but uh, he knows now where he wants to go and I just wonder what the next choice will be for Greg Hancock he's going in blue and he said earlier in that interview that that's exactly where he should go when he spoke with our lads Greg Hancock said gate two is the one to go from so he's got exactly where he wanted to there we wait now for Chris Louis to make his choice and certainly Hans Nielsen will have well they're in white now we see that's Hans Nielsen going in yellow and Chris Louie in white. Hans Nielsen will go from the outside. Chris Louie will go from gate three. Well, those certainly are significant choices and uh, I just wonder whether they've chosen right. Well, uh, I think Greg Hancock's absolutely made up to be on gate two. That's the one that's been working all night and he said already that that's the one he would like. He had second choice. Tony Rickardson had first choice and took gate one. So Greg's going to take this chance now with both hands and... Uh, this could be just the thing that Greg needs to let him win this championship tonight. Well, we await the action here. The starting marshal trying to get them to uh, come together here. But uh, really, Peter, what would you have chosen? Uh, well, I, I, I think um, possibly two is the one that's working. There does seem to be a lot of grip down there. There's a lot of loose dirt, a lot of grip on gate two, and that's the one that's been happening. So I, I think I would have gone with that. Well, certainly, Peter says he would have gone with the choice of gates. Sam Malenko, our former world champion in the studio. Sam, would you have made the choices they have? Um, I, I, I think uh, Greg's got a, he's got a, in his head, you know, I think he thinks two is the best start because he mentioned it earlier. Um, to take a second choice after Tony, Tony coming off of one, it's got to be the next best. Plus, it gives you a nice arc into the first corner. You can kind of watch what's going on and the guys on the outside of you. But what you don't want to happen happen is Tony make a good one and Tony is making good starts, so, uh, you know, you could get pushed out, and the guy from gate three, like Chris Louie did earlier, can sneak right up underneath you. So, I mean, Tony's either got to make a brilliant start and give Greg a chance on the inside of it, or he's got to, Greg's just got to make the start. So I think Tony was in the driving seat on that one. So I think gate one is the one I would have chose. Sam, what about this as a Grand Prix? Because it's had lots of incident, lots of controversy, and lots of action. Have you seen a better one? <laughs> Well, I'm a little, I'm a writer, you know. I mean, I look at these things and I'm thinking, darn, you know, this is our sport and I love it. And uh, some of the things that go on I don't approve of because I see it behind the scenes. But looking at it from a spectacle here, I'm jealous that I'm not a part of it. I think it's brilliant, you know. This has been, this has been great. And the, there's so many people here, nice day. Ah, how much more do you want? Well, you've seen the action behind the scenes, of course, with Mario Yudhu out. We thought that Sam Omalenka might be riding tonight and not with us. Well, I wonder what the action would have been like with him. The tapes are now down. We're coming to the final. This is going to be something pretty special. That man in yellow, Hans Nielsen, may be a veteran, but three times a world champion. In white, there is Chris Louie, Britain's hope. Wouldn't it be great if a Brit could win the British Grand Prix? There is Hans Nielsen, though, who'll be outside him in yellow and black. What are the chances, Peter, for Chris Louie? Well, I think it may work to Chris adva uh, Chris's advantage with Hans being on the outside of him. You know, Chris has only got to just put this one start together now and he could become the champion, uh, British Grand Prix champion. And I think that he's possibly able to do that. I think he can lift himself. We've seen him before when it really counts. He can raise his racing and uh, I really wish he can. I hope he can and I'll be cheering for him. Well, a great race in prospect. Four laps, remember, the final heat. This is the grand final of the British Grand Prix. We have in this event three former world champions plus Britain's captain Chris Louie. 
they could hardly be better. The cream of the World Speedway riders, perhaps with the exception of Thomas Gollum. On his home track, Greg Hancock in gate two must have a great chance. Tony Rickardson, of course, experienced world champion. There's the lineup. Rickardson on the inside. Hancock goes from gate two. Chris Louis, gate three. Hans Nielsen goes from the outside in yellow and black. That's the lineup. Four great riders. Four great laps in prospect as the starting marshal moves away. Away we go. Norman Keatley's done a great job tonight, but they're picking it up this time. Look, going wide is Hans Nielsen going a completely different route to everybody else and picking up the speed off the bend. But at the apex now and in charge is Tony Rickardson, but still Hans Nielsen goes round the outside. Coming through on the inside is Chris Louis. Louis up to second place. Nielsen's at the back. Rickardson in front. Extraordinary tactics at the back by Hans Nielsen. Yes, Hans missed the start, he went very wide, but look there, Tony Rickards, and he's got a commanding lead, but Chris Lewis all over him. Chris has got a good advantage now. They go down the back straight there. He's really chasing after Rickardson. Chris has got whatever he's doing, his bike's working really well. He seems to have Hancock now beaten. A lap to go, Hancock beaten into third place, Chris Lewis in second, but Rickardson probably now out of reach as they go into the final lap. Tony Rickardson, the world champion, will close ground to just nine points on the championship leader Thomas Gollum if he wins this. And that opens the door for the world championship with the vengeance. Tony Rickardson takes the checkered flag at 25 Grand Prix points. Chris Louis for Britain in second place. Third in blue, Greg Hancock, the American former world champion, on his home track. But a night of action, a night of controversy, a night of tremendous speedway has ended with that man there, Tony Rickardson, the current world champion, taking the chequered flag, mounting the rostrum later. A great ride for him, a great night one way and another, but what a ride by Chris Louis. Oh, fantastic for Chris Louis. Uh, I'm sure he's real pleased with that second place. See there, British fans cheering him round. What a ride for Chris, but... The man on form, Tony Rickardson, brilliant. Uh, he's been going so well recently. Now I think he's the man to beat. He set his stall out now in this one. We can see the start, Hans Nielsen on the outside. Hans makes a good start, but Chris Louis next to him just isn't quite in there. But Tony Rickardson in the red helmet, so dominant on that first turn. Uh, there's no idea what's going on behind him. He's riding his own race, but Chris Louis chopped right back to the inside line. Chris, he's very good on that inside. He comes under Greg Hancock, the home man here. Now, Greg must be a little bit disappointed that he couldn't capitalise on this home advantage. But at the moment now, you can see Rickardson is leading the race. Hancock's tucked it right behind him, but what a ride from Rickardson. But Chris Louis is right down on that inside curve. All the grips on there. Tony Rickardson celebrating British GP win 1999 and... Uh, is he going to be a, a major threat to this World Championship now this year? Well, it certainly puts him just nine points behind Thomas Golob as he cheers this, but I can tell you the gaps are closing because Greg Hancock has moved on now to 49 points and really, well, several can now put in a challenge with it closing up. And uh, certainly that man there, Tony Rickardson, has made his mark. Thomas Golob is still the leader, according to my reckoning. Tony Rickardson now in second place and Jimmy Nielsen third. Three great riders there, but Tony Rickardson is certainly the man of the moment. And uh, certainly Tony Rickardson, well, the lads in the studio watched it all. The night has come to an end. Tony Rickardson, the champion. What about it, lads? Whew, I'm exhausted, absolutely exhausted. Physically, mentally, you name it. We've been working out the things, but I am delighted about one thing. More breakdancing in Speedway. The breakdancing king is back That's and right. winning again. The world champion. What a great ride. Congratulations to Tony Rickardson. I mean, he chose gate one. He had he had, he had had was in the driving seat there. He made the best of it. You know, unfortunately, my fellow American, Greg Hancock, kind of looked like he off he had an off foot going into the first corner and didn't have a challenge and never got the rhythm. And Chris did a great job for England to come back in there and get that second place. I'm particularly happy for Chris. Uh, we mentioned him. As, as the program uh, went on about how he was desperate to do well here and he's done exactly what he needed to here well, um, it really was exactly no more he could have asked for I really. think I think all the Brits did well they all fought I mean Joe Screen came in there hard Mark Laram as a wild card proved that he's one of the top contenders in the in the Grand Prix runnings um, you know this has just been a tremendous meeting you know it's there's a good result I mean the the, the current world champion won the event um, he was unlucky not to win or not to have a chance when he got excluded in the first round um, over the years, the guy that won the first round, which was in uh, Prague this year, mm -hmm. won the Grand Prix, and, and that was Greg Hancock. Uh, 
Thomas Golov won it this year. Tony won it the first year when he won the championship. So it's a long road now. We've got two more, two more rounds. And I think significance, obviously, in, the, in what's happened in terms of the championship because it's now somewhat wider open in the fact that Dob Thomas Dollop still leads it with 75 points. But Tony Rickardson now with 66, just nine behind. Jimmy Nielsen slips back. He's 10 behind. But with two Grand Prix left, we're headed for a real showdown, aren't we? I tell you what, it's going to be exciting at Thomas's home track. I mean, he won it there last year at um, Bidgosh, but, you know, it was one of my favorite tracks. I rode there for three years with Thomas, and it is a great racetrack. And if you can understand how to ride it hard, which I think uh, Tony Rickardson, Jimmy might be a little bit, I don't know, but we'll see what happens. Oh, there you the go. I got my break dancing. There he is. <laughs> All right. Well, we can see there the results. And yeah. Tony Rickardson. Well, they got, they got it slightly different than we have, but... Yeah, you know. but um, we know that Thomas Golob's still leading it. Tony Rickardson second on uh, 66. They're just missing Thomas Golob with 75 points there. And as it run down the line there, you can see that what the other guys are up against there. So these are the guys that got to go fight in the challenge if they don't keep going, you know? So there's a, there's a bit of a gap. Got to put you on the spot now. Um, for all this season, the vibe has been Thomas Golob, Thomas Golob. You know, Hancock and all the other guys have sort of drifted by the wayside. Now we've got a completely different situation. No longer just Jimmy Nielsen. We've also got Rick Hardson in there now. And when you see the way he performs and the way he does like he did tonight, you've got to say that with two Grand Prix to go, he's still in this, isn't he? You know, uh, Thomas Golob is a, is a true, truly good rider. So is Tony Rickardson. Um, what we got going here is this is probably not the favorite track for Thomas Golob. As we said, it's one of the difficult tracks for him. Um, I think at the moment, it's, it, you, I mean, Tony Rickards has probably got everything to go for. So does Greg, so do any of the guys. But Tony, Tony can taste it now. You know, I think he's, uh, he's going to be on fire. I think uh, Golob's going to be out, out for a bit of a challenge at his home track. Well, just behind me, the horns are going off because the parade lap is going on. And it's a wonderful atmosphere here in Coventry. Let's go to Tony Millard and Peter Collins to soak up this atmosphere. Soak it up is hardly the word. The action has been frenetic. The temperature has been hot and the humidity high. But that man there has certainly got the adrenaline flowing. The current world champion, Tony Rickardson, back in contention to retain his title. The crowd coming over the barrier here. But Peter Collins, what a night of speedway. And what a night by Chris Lilly. Look at him. Yeah, I think uh, everyone's had a fabulous night speedway here. Full marks to everybody. We've had a fabulous British Grand Prix. And uh, the worthy winner, the man on form, Tony, Tony Rickardson. Like I say, he's been having track records everywhere, big scores, right at the right moment. And he dominated tonight's Grand Prix. But full marks to everybody in Britain that's promoted this. Everybody out there, all the sponsors of the riders, uh, the promoters that have organised the meeting, everybody that have worked on the track, everybody involved. A fabulous night speedway, a fabulous advert, a full stadium on a gorgeous summer's night. What more could we ask for? Well, Tony Rickardson is certainly a happy man. The smiles are there. He went to Kings Lynn this year. Of course, he's riding regularly in the British League Speedway again. He was at Ipswich last year. He's a great friend of many of the British Speedway fans and certainly recognises a lot of people in the crowd, as we see there. The vehicle parade is bringing round the big guns, but we've seen controversy. And I just wonder, well, perhaps in the end, Tony Ricardson has stayed calm, cool and collected throughout. And really, I don't think he's been headed in a race yet, has he, tonight? No, Tony wasn't involved in any of the, uh, the things that were going on, all the distractions that other riders were getting involved in. Uh, Tony just went out there, did the business as a world champion, as the reigning world champion. We know he had a bad round earlier in the year when he was disqualified, but uh, he certainly put the record straight. Well, there he is, shaking the hand of our man, Kelvin Tatum. Thanks, Tony. You must be absolutely delighted winning this British, uh, British Grand Prix tonight, Tony. Yeah, it's been absolutely fantastic. Not only that I always had like bad Grand Prix in England, also that uh, I felt today I could transform my league performance and my league riding into the GP, and it worked good. Yeah, it looked like you were back to the form of last year. You know, you made every start. You know, was there something special you did tonight? Not really, you know, I've been really just plugging away and I've been having a great season so far. It's just been the, the GP got a big rock from the first meeting when I got excluded and after I haven't really got into the groove, but now I'm back and I'm feeling really confident before the next one again. Very well done, Tony. Congratulations. Enjoy your evening now. 
Back to yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Back to uh, Tony and Peter. Well, I have to tell you, Tony Ricardson for went a bit of golf this morning. He's psyched himself up. He has his own camper van on site. He stayed at the track the last couple of nights, and he knows what he's doing. We've seen there. Well, there is Chris Louis. Listen to the British fans cheering the Union Jack, and he's proud of it. The Great Britain captain, really well, so near and yet so far for him. But he did well, Peter. Yes, he did. We know Chris has been struggling in the GPs this year, but this has put the record straight. He deserves better than to be struggling at the back, and he's put his name right up there, and what a ride tonight to get second place. He's had some brilliant meetings in the past here at Coventry, and he's done the same again tonight, and he's done the British fans proud. Well, fifth in the Grand Prix Series last year, Chris Louis, the only one of two British riders to make a main final in the Grand Prix Series. The other one, of course, was Mark Aram. Greg Hancock goes to the third place man, but now it's glory time. Their race director, Ollie Olsen, sends up the man of the moment. There is Tony Ricardson. The garland will be put from Tor Kittleson around his neck. The cup is presented as the British Cranberry title holder to Tony Ricardson. Martin Ockletree there among the presentation party. His family having run this stadium for many, many years. And it really is a special occasion and certainly a triumphant evening for the promotion of British Speedway. And a great evening with a kiss. Perhaps he sealed it for Tony Ricardson. Well, look, he's got enough to carry as he goes up. To, it's a balancing trick. <laughs> The cheers, I'm sure, will greet Tony Ricards and he's been helped with his baggage, but he will pocket the big check as the winner, the British Grand Prix champion, cup and all for Tony Ricards and he shakes the hand of Chris Louie, the hand to his left of Greg Hancock, and now for the Swedish national anthem, the caps come off. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Rickardson is the Grand champion of Great Britain. Well, Tony Rickardson then, the Swedish flag, the fireworks. <laughs> Brandon Stadium is lighting up. For the Swedes, it's a happy night. Greg Hancock content with third place. Chris well, Louie and the British fans absolutely happy. delighted, I'm sure, with his performance. But uh, a marvellous night for Speedway as the cameras gather in front of the dais to greet the winner here. Hidden from us at the moment, but the fireworks are there. The champagne will be bubbling in just a moment, and Tony Ricardson will remember this night for a long while. Perhaps the world champion reborn as the gap is closed now on Thomas Golob with two Grand Prix to go. More figures on that later. But the champagne now is bubbling. What a waste of a good drink, Peter. <laughs> well, we know it usually flies everywhere rather than uh, in the riders' mouths, but uh, it's been fireworks all night, hasn't it? It's been fabulous. Uh, fireworks on the track and off the track, Tony. But now the champagne's flying. We can see there, hats off. Hats off to the Swedes. Well, our own champagne Charlies are still in the studio. Sam Malenko and Jonathan Green. Tony, where's your sense of humour? We always throw the champagne when anybody wins anything, right, Sam? That's I mean, right. you've got to do it. I just hope that Tony drinks lots and lots and lots because I'm racing against him on Tuesday, and if he's on that <laughs> form, it's going to be pretty tough. He is looking awesome, and, you know, you heard in that interview, he really is, you, you get the feeling that he's back. He's shown that body language that says, I'm back, I'm ready to go for this now. Well, it just opens the whole thing up, you know. It's real important that this, uh, this sport dr drives on, and, you know, Tony's a good good ambassador to the sport. He's a fast racer. Thomas Golov's a fast racer. So, I mean, it's just going to make the last couple of rounds really exciting, and I can't wait to see them. All right, well, let's just uh, quickly check on what we were talking about earlier, which is the standings, of course. And there it is. Thomas Golub leads it with 75 points. Remember, two Grand Prix, 25 for a Grand Prix win, two Grand Prix left. Tony Rickardson now nine points behind in second place with Jimmy Nielsen. I'm probably a very disappointed Jimmy Nielsen. One of the favorites tonight. He's in third. Jason Crump still in there and a great performance by Greg Hangup to get up to fifth. That's right. I mean, you got Stefan Daniel hanging in there with 45 and Joe Screen on 44 and Lee Adams on 39. I mean, these guys, it's really important for those bottom guys to hang in there because they don't want to go to that challenge and stay away from it. But you can see how it breaks from 45, 44, then 39. There's a tail, a bunch of guys standing there in the tail end of that. And those guys in the, in the 30 mark are all going to have a, a chance. 
massively significant. Chris Louie and Mark Laram, the top 10, remember, very important to stay in that top 10. Hans Nielsen did no harm to himself either. He's now in 11th place, but Chris Louie and Mark Laram will be well happy with that. And there's a chance with it zero out that Laram could ride again in the next one. That's right. I mean, it's uh, it's been a great it's been a great uh, four rounds so far. I've really enjoyed it, and it's uh, it just goes to show the caliber of racing out there. Anything can happen, and you know Thomas Golob was unlucky tonight when he seen the yellow lights on. I witnessed them. I seen him come on, but like Jason says, it's real important to keep racing until you see a red light. I mean, even when you see the red light, unless you see something in front of you that it's, that's dangerous, you keep going until you're sure. Yeah, it was a smart move by Jason, and, and quite rightly, you say as a racer, you keep racing until somebody tells you to stop. You get the feeling the way Golub's night had gone, he kind of was like looking for something, looking for an excuse, because well, he was already in fourth sure. place. Let's remember that. I mean, the race before that, he, he you know, pleaded on his engine failure or something went wrong with his bike, and, and I asked uh, Steve if he can keep an eye and see if he's changing, and he didn't do nothing to it, and he went out and he rode it in the Constellation race, so... Whether he just didn't have anything more or, or what, but he was looking, you know, for a little pity maybe on the racetrack, and that's kind of his style sometimes because he's used to winning. I mean, that's the kind of rider he is. He just – everything's win or, or nothing. So, I mean, he had, a, he had a chance of getting something out of that maybe by the yellow light. I mean, it, it is distracting, and it does happen, but uh, you can't give up in a Grand Prix. Nothing stops you until you see a red light in front of your face. Well, down in the pits, the king of Kelva. Kelvin himself has been having a great time. He's now with the British man, of course, who's done so brilliantly tonight. Chris Louie, over to you. Thanks, Jonathan. Chris, second place in the British Grand Prix. You must be absolutely delighted. Yeah, I am. It was a tough struggle. I, I struggled in the early heats. I was having to make up from uh, gate four all the time. And, um, you know, we, we got things much, much better in the end, and the bike was good. Good enough to win the race, but Tony got out in front, and, you know, he stayed there. So... Uh, I'm very happy. I've had some disasters in the British GPs. You know, I'd, I'd love to have won one, but second place is great. I know, and uh, you know, look, you've been struggling a bit in the Grand Prix, but to bounce back at your home Grand Prix, you must be delighted. Yeah, it was a turning round point, really, because uh, you know it was the fourth one. I mean, I had to get the job done. I've got to start going back up the ladder, and uh, yeah, we're on the way now. I hope. Okay, well, congratulations again, and very well done. Super. Back to you and the competitors are all in the studio. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> That'll do, Kelvin. We're right here, but uh, brilliant words from Chris Louie. He's back on track. He's revamped his Grand Prix uh, campaign. And, of course, we'll be back to see him and several others in action. Gollop will be in action as well next week as we go down to the Ipswich, which is the current champions, of course. And with Gollop riding well and Chris Louie riding well, you'd have to say Eastbourne will be up against it. That's our next Elite League coverage. And, of course, coming up live from Brands Hatch, it's the World Superbikes Race 1 and 2 and the World Super Sport. All I can say is if you like the kind of action you've just seen, go to bed right now, get up very early tomorrow morning and join us then. My thanks to Kelvin, my thanks to Sam Omalenko. We'll see you at Brands. Bye-bye for now.